This is the Power of Team America podcast, and today we're talking Sheffield and game day coaching with the legendary game day coach himself, Matt Gary. Matt recently published the game day coaching manual, which should be a central reading for anyone involved in powerlifting. We talked about the core tenets of Matt's game day approach, and then we get into Sheffield, which we both agree is the greatest powerlifting competition ever held. Before we start, don't forget that Powerlifting America has two more national competitions coming up with University Nationals on April 15th and the grand finale of them all, Sub Junior, Junior, Masters, and Equipped Nationals starting June 2nd. The classic divisions are almost full and equipped is not that far behind. So sign up now before you miss your shot at making one of the U.S. national teams. Thank you to SBD and Aleco for the continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America. Now with that, let's get into this interview with game day coaching legend, Matt Gary. What is up, Matt Gary, the legendary game day coach? How's it going, Matt? Outstanding, man. Thank you for having me. So having you on here because, you know, you, you obviously you're one of the greatest minds in the sport, you know, as we've uh, witnessed at the press conferences and stuff. I thank you so much for le- leaning on you so heavily for doing those for us um, at, in Austin. And I love always just our conversations and talking with you. And um, you got a new book out and it's an amazing book. I've, I've read it from cover to cover. Uh, I love it. It's, it's um, I think, going to be a game changer for everyone who reads it. And then I also wanted to kind of get your perspective because I know you were at Sheffield. You were sitting in the front row. So kind of want to do a little bit of a book review slash Sheffield recap show and uh, kind of get the perspective from one of the best minds in the sport, um, just kind of on this biggest meet that's ever happened in powerlifting, what you thought about it. For sure. Does that sound good? Um, So to start with, with the book. So it just came out. It's a game day coaching manual. Um, You've been head coach of so many teams, assistant coach on so many teams, personal coach, so many amazing lifters. And it's all, (laughs) all that is covered in the book. Um, But I just want to kind of ask you, what's the general idea of the SSPT game day strategy? What's like kind of like the underlying philosophy of like what you're trying to accomplish on, on game day? The underlying philosophy of what we're trying to accomplish is that you're you're building a total and and you have nine point scoring opportunities to do that. And so each opportunity should be cherished. And uh, you know we're we're assuming that each opportunity is going to um, become increasingly more difficult and require greater strength. And so as you accumulate points, um, just matter of factly, the more successful attempts that you have, um, that therefore increases your ability to build a bigger total and score more points. And so uh, that's the name of the game is being, building the biggest total possible. And I think what we've seen recently, you know, and it's one of the reasons for publishing the book is because I wanted to put kind of this how to manual out into the powerlifting community is the fact that I think we can all um, understand now that powerlifting is, has truly become a sport. It's no longer just the strongest of the strongest, you know, going out there and or the strongest of the strong, I should say, going out there and having a test day. It's it, it, it's not a max out day anymore. Um, we don't see it or it's very rare to see these genetic outliers, if you will, who can go into a competition and wipe the floor with their competitors. Um, yeah. We may occasionally see that, but the tide has risen and a, tie, a high tide raises all boats. And so the talent pool is not only... Um, you know, deeper, it's just more populated with more lifters because powerlifting is becoming more popular. So because of that, um, it's more imperative than ever before that you build your biggest total ever. And so, um, you know, your biggest total possible. And so the underlying theme of the book is is understanding how to leverage advantages um, and, and understanding how to play the game and maximize your true potential by making as many attempts as you possibly can. So what would you say to someone who says, like, if, if you go nine for nine, you're, you're, uh, you're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, I actually have a meme in the book, you know, with a clown that's saying that it's, I mean, that's just like, and, and that's why I use a clown in the meme is just because it's such a clown statement. It's, it's, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous to say that you're not, you know, that you're not trying hard enough um, that you're, you're equating failing, you know, a lift, missing a lift, and and that's supposed to somehow determine your your level of effort and your level of success. And so it's, you you know, and I I even kind of 
say, you know, why, why are, if, if, if going nine for nine is so terrible, then why are the people who do it, why do they always look so happy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. They, they literally look ecstatic after yeah. they do it. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's not supposed to be this one-off thing. It's not supposed to be this unicorn thing. It's supposed to be something that you strive for. I'm not saying that it's not hard, that it's not challenging. I mean, look, yeah. anybody can go into a competition and sandbag and lowball all their attempts and make nine easy attempts. That, that we're, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about pushing the envelope, pushing the boundaries of human performance, but being strategic in doing so mm -hmm. um, while trying to make all nine lifts. And yeah, it's challenging, but it's not impossible. And so, and it's, you know, people who insinuate that, that, you know, you, you're not, that, that you have to fail in order to determine your amount of effort. It's, it's just ludicrous. I mean, it's silly. It's laughable. So. I, I, I love, I, there's a line somewhere in the book along the lines of like, I never realized the goal was to try so hard that you miss lifts. Exactly. Um, I mean, it just, like you said, it just, it's just completely counterintuitive. You see someone go over nine for nine, they're ecstatic like you said. Um, and so that makes no fun. sense. It's, it's, it's like a batter going up to bat, you know, they're, they're not intentionally trying to miss. They, they, they want to make contact and put the ball in play. Yeah. It's like saying, uh, you know, uh, if you're a home run hitter, it's like, well, you have to strike out a bunch of times in order to be a good home run hitter. It's like, no, you know, it, it's the opposite. When you hit a lot of home runs, you, uh, it comes with the territory that you might strike out a lot of times. But the yeah. goal is not to strike out so many times that you hit a lot of home runs. I mean, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it doesn't make it's a completely backwards logic. Exactly. Um, and, and I mean, getting into this idea of like the level of competition has gone up so much. I mean, the difference between making nine lifts and making eight lifts often is the difference between winning and losing. I mean, we saw it at Sheffield, uh, how many people were pulling for the win or to uh, for placing or for world record at the end. And, you know, like, like we can think of, Jess, uh, Bittner, you know, um, where do you think Carlina, I mean, all, all these big pulls at the end, obviously, if you go nine for nine, you make more attempts, you're going to get, put yourself in a better position to not have to necessarily go all out on your last of them to the worst point where you're like falling over, passing out. I mean, we saw Noemi, you know, falling over, like, like there's a couple battles right there. We can name off the top of the head where yep. it comes down to you make or miss that ninth lift That's is going to determine the outcome. Yeah, I mean Evie Corrigan, you know, which was the the dark, the biggest dark horse, the dark horse of all dark horses, right? No, nobody, literally, literally nobody, had her on their radar in terms of coming in, myself included. I'm the first one to raise my hand and say that I got blindsided by this. I didn't think that the cut was going to go so well. I didn't think that that was, you know, what I mean, that she was going to be able to perform um, to such a high level. And she, she not only exceeded expectation, but she knocked it so far out of the freaking park it's just unbelievable so hats off to her hats off to her coach to Kedrick Kwan who wrote the chapter in my book on making weight uh, hats off to, the, to her and her entire team she had flawless execution and, and to your point Paul what you just said she made nine lifts and Noemi made eight and so yep. that was the difference at the end of the day was the final deadlift that was missed by Noemi yes she had the opportunity yes she had the winning pull in her hands but matter of factly, when you make, you know, nine attempts are going to be better than eight, eight are better than seven and so on and so forth. And so it just, yeah, it came down to the end there. And it's exciting to see that at this biggest competition, um, you know, that the winners, you know, the, 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 the two most prestigious outcomes, if you will, both went nine for nine. Yeah. And then the second and the, and the second place uh, and, and third place, uh, second place finishers went eight for nine, I believe. No, he yeah. came eight, yeah, eight for nine. And so did, so did Jonathan Kaiko. So, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's exciting to see that because it lends credence to my argument that making lifts is, is better. Yes, obviously. And, uh, I think we'll see that again and again. And that's one thing, you know, I want to have you on this from time to time and we can, uh, when there's big meets and things like that, and we can kind of go over some of these, um, you know, as these things actually unfold in real time, I'm thinking now, as I've read your book, you know, like, oh, this is what Matt Gary would have done, or this is what Matt Gary uh, would have predicted, you know, things like this. And I mean, we saw it across the board too. I mean, if we if we judge the uh, the Sheffield Championships by other metrics, and we look at, you know, like for instance, we look at dots, um, or we look at good lift points, you know, we see Amanda again. She's at the top of this list. She went nine for nine. Right. Yep. Bonico went nine for nine. I mean, yep. so, so there was a couple, there was a, only a handful of lifters that went nine for nine. And then, like you said, on the other side of the coin, on the men's side, you can see that, I mean, Keiko and Gavin, 
they both miss their third squats, which, you know, we can get into you know, like the, probably I'm thinking good chance. They're going to miss their third deadlifts at the end of this, because you know, some statistics that are in the book, right. um, but they ended up pulling it off, but they both went eight for nine. And then Delaney also went eight for nine. And that's your top four right there yeah. for the guy on the guy's side. I mean, only yeah. three missed lifts in your whole top four on, on the men's side. That's a pretty high percentage. It is. It's a really high percentage. And, and so, yeah, once again, I mean, it sounds like we're beating a dead horse, but it's the truth. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it is. It's obvious to us, you know, more, more attempts is better. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic to see them executing at such a high level. And, th and that's what you want. You know, anybody, can, it's easy to miss lifts. Anybody yeah. can go in and miss you and I can <laughs> go in and miss. I mean, it's, you know, anybody can go in and miss lifts, but you, you know, for high performers and elite level performers in any endeavor, we're not talking just not powerlifting. You want to see baseball players hit the ball. You know what I mean? You want to you want to you want to see good pitchers strike out batters. You want to see people who are highly skilled and high performers be the best and do things with a high success rate. You don't want to see a, a lot of misses, a lot of whiffs. You know. And I and I think like that's something I, that's very important for the professionalism of the sport, um, making it a watchable event trying to get the sport to become more professional mainstream we, you got to start making lifts like you know when you see some of these i i mean i tuned in when i first tuned into powerlifting there were some big big ish money meets i would say and i would tune in and you would just see people just missing constantly and it was just it was boring and you're just thinking like wow right. these are supposed to be the best lifters right. and they miss all the time so right i think it's important like you said you know also just like the, the level of the sport as it gets better and better this you're gonna have to get to hitting nine for nine so all right definitely we're beating a dead horse also just want to quickly you know there's you have data through, throughout the book i mean yep. you you actually go and crunch the numbers and um i think one of the interesting stats was that at the ipf world championships the world champions themselves successfully generally make 7.4 attempts that's right which is about 82% success rate. So if you can do better than that, you're putting yourself in that top 20%, you know, I yeah. mean, you're putting it in, And then, so, I mean, it's just, you're giving yourself a better chance of winning. If you can make more than 7.4 attempts, which is on average, what the champion is doing. That's right. Yeah. So it's, oh. yeah, it's just always better to make more lifts. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's never an advantage to miss a lot of attempts. It's just not. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, because like I said, you, you you have nine lifts. So each attempt represents a little bit over 11% of your opportunity to, to score points. Mm -hmm. And so why would you intentionally want to miss one of those and so forth? And so that's why this attempt selection becomes so critical, particularly on the third attempts. You know, that's that's the greatest skill that a game day coach must possess is they must be able to accurately assess the second attempt, which is a data point, and determine how much does my lifter have left in the tank while also considering what the opposition are doing at the end of the meet, you know, obviously for final rounds of deadlifts and so forth, but it's determining what that third attempt is. And so, you know, I kind of use the analogy in the book that it's like, it's like filling a, a, a bucket with water. You know what I mean? And so you you literally and figuratively want to fill that bucket or that glass with as much water as you possibly can up to the tippy tippy top so that you don't splash any out. When you yeah. when you pick an attempt that is too much for your lifter, you have this splash and this wasted, you know, opportunity, if you will. And yeah. so the, then you're left matter of factly with less water in the bucket or the glass. It's also analogous to the American game show, The Price is Right where at the end, they're trying to guess the, the value of this, you know, in the, in the showcase showdown, if you will. So we're literally trying to, to put a weight on the bar that is as close to the lifters zenith, as close to their capability without them tipping over is what mm -hmm. you want to do because you get no credit for misses and nobody cares how much weight you miss. They only care how much make, weight you make because that's yeah. all you have to get credit for. Well, I think uh, the other thing to think about is like you, you, you mentioned this 11%, like I'm not a math guy. I love numbers. I love crunching data and stuff, math, but math and numbers, they don't come natural to me, yep. but uh, that's a lot uh, of your attempts, you know, like that's a yeah. big chunk. Like if your total is hundred percent and you go down by 11, now you're at 91% or see, I'm telling you, I'm bad at math. 89%, 89%, 89%. <laughs> proved my point. Um, 
but yeah. And so if we think about football, for instance, like I'm a big football guy and we talk about like possessions, you know, like I'm, I'm everyone knows I'm a big Kansas City Chiefs fan, Patrick Mahomes, you know, yep. w- when you're playing in a sport like that, it's actually like the number one strategy is to reduce the number of possessions that Patrick Mahomes will have. If you think on average, you're going to get two possessions a quarter, that's eight possessions a game. If you can eliminate one possession from Patrick Mahomes, that's huge. That's, that's everyone's, that's like their number one strategy uh, to, to compete against against And here in powerlifting, no one can take those attempts away from you, but you can throw them away by making bad attempt selection. So it's just like in any other sport, this is a, a, such a no brainer. Um, but it's definitely something that I wanted to just, you know, this is the underlying philosophy of the book. All right. Yep. So um, yep. you're going to get this throughout the book, make attempts, be consistent, talk about how consistency could be a weapon. Like, you know, I think, I don't know if that phrase is in the book, but yeah, I definitely wrote, wrote down somewhere. Consistency is a weapon. And that was yeah. like kind of burned into my head. Yeah, it, it, it is written in the book in, in, in several places. And so one of the ways that it becomes a weapon is, is so, you know, you, you, you wanted me to touch upon these ACE cards. And so yeah. As a coach at the beginning of the day, when your lifters are warming up and you're kind of looking at whatever scoring simulation they're using, in this case at Sheffield, we'll just use that one as an example, you mm-hmm. know, the opening weights go up on, on lifting cast. And so all of the coaches have access to this information, you know, in the United States of America, that's what we're using now is lifting cast. Most of the time at IPF events, it's largely good lift. And mm-hmm. so both of these, you're able to look and you can begin to, to, to track what's out there and see where you have an advantage. And so matter of factly, you know, you can have these different ACE cards up your sleeve. I kind of use that analogy. Mm-hmm. Matter of factly, the, the biggest ACE card to have up your sleeve is to have the strongest lifter in the room, right? You want the apex predator, if you will, of the weight class. And so, you know, having the highest strength ceiling, if you will, is hard to overcome. If your lifter is the strongest lifter in the room, that's going to be hard to overcome unless that lifter makes errors, make, you know, poor execution, stupid attempts, and so on and so forth. The next ace card, or one of the next ace cards, is having the lot number advantage. And so the lot number determines not only the order in which you weigh in, but it determines the order in which two lifters will take an attempt when they call for the same weight. So if Matt and Paul both call for 100 kilos, and Paul has the lower lot number, my lot number is higher, that means I get to see Paul go first. And so Paul would go first at 100 kilos, and then I would take it after Paul, and I would matter of factly get to see how his lift moved. So that particularly becomes an advantage or a distinct advantage, obviously, at the end of the day, in the deadlift where you're jockeying for position. Mm -hmm. So lot number is huge. Body weight is another advantage. You know, the lighter person, if we tie on total, if, if, if Paul and Matt tie on total and Paul is lighter, then Paul is matter of factly pound for pound stronger, right? And then a fourth advantage um, is is having, um, you know, the opportunity to uh, put, we call it chips on the bar, you know, to take a record attempt, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you don't have those advantages, right? Because sometimes you'll go into a meet and your lifter doesn't have any of those ace cards up their sleeve, none Mm -hmm. of them, Um, you know, then they have to use consistency as a weapon. And that's just making attempts, building a total. And every single time that you make an attempt, you put pressure on your opposition to make theirs. And so it's just like you said, if I can, you know, if I'm playing defense against the Kansas city chiefs, you know, or I'm playing offense rather against the Kansas city chiefs defense, I want to matter of factly possess the ball for as long as I possibly can. I don't want to turn it over. I don't want to fumble or like fumble an attempt. A missed lift is like a fumble in football. Exactly. I'm then, I'm then giving Paul the opportunity to score more. And exactly. So you would never want to do that. So I don't want to fumble an attempt, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so that's when consistency becomes a huge weapon. Because if I don't possess any of those things like lot number, body weight advantage, or, or if I'm not the strongest deadlifter, you know, we talk about being the strongest lifter, but if I'm not the strongest deadlifter and don't have the opportunity to pull last mm-hmm. to have the final say in the final event, then consistency is going to be my best weapon. And I need to go out and I need to execute to a high standard and I need to make all nine lifts and put pressure on my opposition. So yeah, Yeah. consistency is huge, particularly for people who don't possess any of those advantages. 
Yeah, I think I think we, you know we refer to other sports analogies and things like this. Um, one one phrase that comes to mind is like the fundamentals. Like you always hear people say they they're good on the fundamentals. They don't beat themselves. You know, they're not going to make mistakes. You're going to have to go out there and take it away from them. You know, all these cliche phrases that we hear in sports talk um, all the time about basically like, you know, um, they, they're they good. They're not going to beat themselves. They're not going to make these fumbles. They're not going to give turnovers. They're not going to make mistakes. Um, and in some teams out there, like in other sports, we'll, we can talk about um, where they may not have a flashy quarterback like Patrick Mahomes. They may not be able to score, you know, uh, two touchdowns in 13 seconds like they did at the end of the last season, you know, um, things like this. So th- what they have to do is get a lead in the early part of the game and and not turn the ball over and possess the ball. And it's sometimes a little boring football to watch from people, you know, good defense, running game, run the clock, things like this. And um, but that's a recipe for success. Yeah. And that's one way to win. I mean, like you said, of course, if you have the strongest guy in the room, you know, you come in and they can miss attempts and and whatever. And they, you know, as long as they make one one or two attempts on each lift, like that's going to, that's going to be enough. But, um, but if you don't, and if we're in this ultra competitive universe, which we're starting to be in now, um, that's not going to cut it anymore. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's not going to cut it. You're not going to have somebody come in and only make four or five attempts and win. It's just not going to happen. And if you do, that's going to be a one-off you know, and you're not, you're not likely to see that again, because these weight classes are stacked and um, yeah. And the coaching is, is getting better and the, and the, and the, and the quality of the lifter is improving. And so, yeah, it's, it's very rare that you're going to see that. So just real quick to review. All right. So people are listening to professor Gary taking notes. Like I'm typing out some notes as we're going here. Um, You know, these, these advantages, we're talking strongest lifter, strongest deadlifter, um, body weight advantage, lot number advantage, and then chips. And just real quick, tell us about why is it that this being the strongest deadlifter is so important? So, I mean, it's the strongest, it, yeah, being the strongest deadlifter is so important because it's the last event, right? And so, you know, way back when the order of powerlifting competition was different. It, it wasn't squat oh. bench. Yeah, it wasn't squat bench deadlift. Oh. They used to, they used to, um, I believe they used to bench first and then squat and deadlift um, second and third, but they decided to, to reorder the competition. And this is the most logical way to do it. And so because the deadlift is last, the deadlifters or the best deadlifters are matter of factly going to get the final say, you mm-hmm. know, because if I, if, if I'm able to go after the rest of the competition, then I matter of factly will be able to see what you've done. You know, you will have played your game before I finish playing my game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you will have taken all of your nine attempts and then I can survey the scoreboard at the end of the competition and matter of factly see what weight do I need to move up in placing to potentially win to, at, you know, at a world championships, they give individual medals. So you, you, you may have a, you may have a lifter who's not in the running for the podium, but they might be in running for a deadlift medal. You know what I mean? And, and therefore maybe, you know, move up from like seventh to fourth place overall while securing a gold in the deadlift. So that's kind of cool sometimes, but because the deadlift is the last event, that's the reason why it's, you know, if they, if they look, if they just flipped it, then the advantage presumably would go to the best squatters, right? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Because the best squatters would then have the final say, you know, yeah. so it's, it's whomever is allowed to go last or toward the bottom of the flight as a matter of fact, we're going to have the advantage. So it's, yeah. yeah, it's almost always an advantage to be a better deadlifter when you're not as good of a deadlifter, or you're kind of known as one of these subtotal lifters who has a really strong squat, a really strong bench and so forth. You know, like for instance, a Gavin Aiden is more of a subtotal lifter. However, as we saw at Sheffield, he hit a PB deadlift and smoked his third attempt. Mm-hmm. And so now you know, Gavin's not known really as a subtotal guy anymore. I mean, his deadlift is now on the come up to the extent where he's going to put pressure on everybody else. But I'm just saying, you know, oftentimes people that are, you know, and, and they have that kind of build to them, you know, a lot of the yeah. subtotal people are these, these fire yeah. hydrant looking lifters, they're short and thick and squatty and their, and, and their, their, their leverages are, are more pronounced and lend themselves to pushing you know, squatting and benching. And so those types of lifters, you know, that aren't going to be able to pull last, they have to build the biggest subtotal that they possibly can. They have to gain a lead. And then it's almost at the end where they're just trying to hang on for dear life. Mm -hmm. And so to that point, it's critical for those lifters to make nine attempts because 
if they if they don't, they're literally giving the game away. You know, they're, yeah. they're, you want to make your opposition go out on the platform and beat you. You know, mm-hmm. you want to make them make their final deadlift. You don't want to miss your final deadlift. So you then have a lower total and you're, you know, the opposition has already won and they can put on the bar whatever they need or whatever yeah. they want, I should say. I mean, I think we kind of see that um, in the 76s with Carlina and Jess and obviously Agatha is like the big subtotal queen, right? And then, but Jess is always kind of going to have that final say. And yeah. it's a matter of if she hits it or if she doesn't hit it, if she's going to win or not. She's going to load up the right number uh, on the, put the right number on the bar. And then, and then that's exactly, what you know, and that, and that's what she did at Worlds in South Africa with where we've had that legendary battle between the two of them and they're going back and forth. And then Jess just, Matter of factly, because like to your point, she's the strongest deadlifter and at that time was able to pull the greatest deadlift in IPF history on the on the women's side, you know, load up that 261.5 and and tie Agatha and win on body weight. So, you know, Agatha, because she achieved that total first, got credit for the world record. Uh, but Jess, matter of factly, because she was the lighter lifter and therefore pound for pound stronger was, you know, became the world champion that day. But if Agatha had missed one that her, her, whatever her last deadlift that she made was, then it's just handed to her. Jess just wins, wins on a walk-off basically. Exactly. And then Jess can just load up for fun whenever she wants in in theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, kind of going through some of these like, you know, strategy things. I think like, this is kind of like the meat and potatoes of the book. There's a lot of stuff in this book that is not about strategy. There's philosophy. Like there's a lot of things that are really I think we'll give people a new perspective on, on not just powerlifting, but on life. But obviously, you know, we want to focus on these things. The other one that I wanted to mention, because you went over them pretty fast. I mean, body weight, that one's pretty obvious. Because, you know, if we, if I weigh more than you, I got to lift two and a half more than you. That's, that's as simple it. as that. Two and a half, if that's the difference in the meat, if, if we, like we're saying, the population of lifters is so close the, today that that could be the difference. Um, and then lot number, you know, again, it's like if, taking the weight, uh, whether you're going to take the weight first or not, whether you can go up, whether you can change your deadlift and go down. I mean, so there's a, a big example in the book of, you know, Bryce Lewis and Ashton Ruska 2019, uh, nationals, you know, where basically Bryce took a, a weight that, and he had the higher lot number, which meant that Ashton couldn't take that weight and had to go up. And if, you know, he ended up having to take more weight than he needed to win and ended up, ended up missing and losing. Um, and then the, the other one was just chips and just kind of explain like how chips can give you an advantage. It's kind of similar in the, in the sense of these other two that we just mentioned, it can force someone to lift more than they have to. That's right. So, so what we mean when we say chips on the bar, so the smallest increment in powerlifting that you can go up between attempts is 2.5 kilos, which is 5.5 pounds. And so, but, but if you want to increase either a national record or a world record, the minimum increase is 0.5 kilos which is 1.1 pounds. And mm-hmm. so in order to, 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 to go up by 0.5 kilos or 1.1 pounds, we put these really small, we call them chips, these small discs on either side of the bar and matter of factly allows us to go up by 0.5 kilos. So if you have one of those opportunities to throw on a number that is not a, a 2.5 kilo increment, right? It matter of factly, uh, to, uh, and you put that on the bar to secure a record, like if I'm competing against Paul and I've done that in the squat or I've done that in the bench or, or what have you, then, and if Paul doesn't, isn't strong enough to secure a record, then, then I'm going to have that extra 0.5 yeah. added on to my total. So at the end of the day, Paul is matter of factly going to have to outlift me. And the only way to do that would be for him to take two and a half kilos more in order to secure that higher total. So that's where it becomes so valuable. Mm-hmm. And then oftentimes what you'll see, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, but at, at high levels, you know, sometimes you will see chips in play uh, in different events. And so, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like at the Sheffield, for instance, um, unfortunately, Gavin missed his third squad on depth. Mm-hmm. Now, had he made that attempt, uh, and let me just look to see what he, he took. He, he attempted 336.5. So that's an irregular number because what we're used to seeing is we're used to seeing either 335 kilos or 337 and a half. Mm -hmm. So he chose 336 and a half. So he would have had that 1.5 kilo advantage actually, because that's Mm -hmm. 1.5 kilos over um, a whole number. And then of course we saw Jonathan Keiko, 
who um, was able to use chips on the bar and the bench press. So mm -hmm. what they would have done at that time, because Jonathan was actually the lighter of the two lifters, had Gavin made that third squat attempt, then Jonathan and his team would have had to have been mindful of that. And they would have had, or, or they would have in all likelihood, selected a number that made sure that they could actually tie Gavin. So they would have used those chips to their advantage to make sure that, it, that they added an extra 1.5 onto their total as well. So that at the end of the day, they would be tied because they're lighter and they can win on body weight. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's rare that we, that we see it in every discipline. I was kind of hoping it didn't work out that way, but I really wanted to see it in the battle of the 76s, right? Because yeah. you've got Carlina, you know, Jess kind of, you know, was lurking around the opportunity of maybe trying a world record, but you had Carlina, this incredible squatter who's already got the world record in the squat. You know, you have her attempting a world record in the squat. And then I was really hopeful that Agatha was going to be in the mix. Obviously, as you know, kind of, you know, spoiler alert, she mm -hmm. came in kind of injured and was performing it less than her abilities. But you were hoping to see, you know, Carlina have the chips advantage in the squat, Agatha have the chip advantage in the bench. And then, of course, Jess, you know, having the final say with that dead, you know, chips on the bar and the deadlift. And that would have been like the most exciting thing to see. Now, of course, you know, it didn't unfold quite the way that we, you know, had hoped for in a perfect world. But in theory, that would have been really, really cool to see. You know, yeah. same thing if like Chance Mitchell had competed. Obviously, everybody knows the chance withdrew. You know, you yeah. potentially could have had Gavin setting a world record in the squat or Amar. And then you've got, you know, Jonathan Keiko in the bench and then presumably Chance, you know, putting chips on the bar. So rarely do we see it uh, where, where lifters have those chip advantages in each and every discipline like that. But that, you know, that's really cool to see. But anyway, all mm -hmm. that matter of factly means that you can set a record. And then at the end of the day, you're forcing your opposition to go up an additional two and a half so that they can essentially trump your total. Yeah. And I think, I think like one of the big takeaways, like, cause I think we remember if we think back to uh, South Africa worlds in South Africa, Agatha wasn't taking chips on bench mm -hmm. and that could have made a big difference. I mean, that if you, you see Jess's final deadlift, I mean, you know, she seems like she always has more in the tank. I mean, we, we saw her limit at Sheffield at least, but yep. um, I mean, if, if she had to just pull 0.5 more, I mean, in that case, she's, the pulling for a world record so she can match that chip, you know, so it's pretty easy in that case. But if she wasn't pulling for a deadlift world record, that could have made, that could have made a big difference in the end. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jess was fortunate obviously to be the greatest deadlifter in, in that weight class's history. And yeah. so to be able to put that on the bar, but to your point, it's a card that you just, you, you have to play. Mm -hmm. I was literally shocked when I saw Agatha not use chips on her attempts I was yeah. just like appalled. I'm thinking to myself, I don't care if you're strong enough. It's a card that you just have to play. Even if you don't think you're going to need it, you yeah. just play it anyway. You just, you know, you force and your opposition at the end of the day, because every kilo, I mean, every half kilo counts. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's a card you have to play. And I mean, when you're, when you're getting close to the limit, two and a half kilos is like five pounds, um, especially in some weight class. I mean, like for Jesus, that's not going to be like a crazy difference, but we're talking in some of the middle and lighter weight, weight classes, an extra two and a half kilos is massive, but uh, a 0.5, that's only one extra pound yeah. more often than not. I mean, it's rare that you're going to see a lift where you're like, you don't have even one more pound. I mean, yes, it happens, but right. that's why it's kind of one of those no brainers. You have to play this card when you have it, because there's not a lot of risk in adding 0.5 kilos to the bar when you're already taking a world record, you know, you're already strong enough. And then, but there is a lot of reward, you know, because five pounds is certainly, um, like I said, I'm not a math genius, but it's like a lot more than one, one pound, right? <laughs> 1.1 yeah. or whatever. <clears throat> so, so yeah. So anyway, I just want to emphasize this stuff. You know, if people are listening to this, they can go get the book. It goes through tons of scenarios for this kind of stuff. So you'll see it out. I mean, you go attempt by attempt through a lot of different scenarios, um, we're kind of talking here about Sheffield because it's the latest thing that's happened and, and um, you know, it's obviously captured everyone's attention what's going on with Sheffield. But <clears throat> the other one I wanted to talk about, so we nailed all of the five advantages. And then the last one was something that you, you mentioned it once already. Um, this is the single greatest skill that a game day coach has to have. And you said it's the ability to assess that second attempt and then right. put in the right number for the third attempt. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book, you know, 
there's no one weird trick here. <laughs> like, like, and so uh, just tell people like, how, how do you, how do you get to the point where you know exactly what the right number is? So I have an entire chapter on data. And so what I've done is I've studied the data and I've examined the data so that you don't have to. And so I've looked at over a hundred competitions and over 17,000 individual performances. So it's a nice chunk of data. It's sizable. Um, I don't feel like I have to review any more because the trends aren't changing. Um, when I've examined a meet, you know, we're talking about 0.001 difference or 0.1 difference. It's, it's absolutely negligible. But all that is said to say this, that I've examined the data. And so I understand the percentage ranges of, of maximum. And I talk about that in the book of, you know, theoretically where, where and how you should be choosing your attempts and which, uh, you know, strength zone, if you will, yields the greatest results, yield, yields the highest likelihood of success. Mm -hmm. And so you can apply those percentages to people of different strength levels. And so obviously that's going to look much different for a Jesus Olivares, who's a super, than it is going to look for, you know, um, a 66 kilo lifter or a 52 kilo lifter. And so, but what I've done is, and I actually have a chart in the book, is utilizing those percentages, those strength zones, if you will, I've applied it to lifters of different strength levels and essentially given you a GPS mm -hmm. to get you closer, right? Um, it's, it, 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 it's not perfect. No, no method is perfect. No method is flawless, but it gets you closer. It gets you in the neighborhood, in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. And then you as a coach, like you said, there's no one weird trick. There's no, uh, mm -hmm. you know, attempt selection hack. I can't give you that. You just matter of factly have to increase your coaching acumen by studying thousands and thousands of lifts. It's watching lifters lift, lifters compete, watch attempts of lifters of all abilities, all weight classes, both formats, classic and equipped. And continue mm -hmm. to do that. And once you think that you've done enough, do thousands more. I mean, literally. Mm -hmm. And just the more you do it, you know, your, your sword, I use the analogy of a samurai sword, your katana can never be sharp enough. And so mm -hmm. you want to continue to get better at that skill. And look, sometimes you're going to get it wrong. Sometimes you put the right number, the wrong number on the bar, or sometimes you actually kind of have the right number on the bar, but your lifter goes out and just doesn't execute for whatever reason. They get in their head mentally, something happens, you know, you have, but anyway, suffice it to say that it's getting you closer to that exact number and then to get better at calling those attempts. It's just practice. It's like anything else. Mm -hmm. It's just thousands and thousands of repetitions. And fortunately, I've been blessed to be doing that for quite a long time, you know, 28 years now. And so, you know, it just means I'm old. <laughs> so, so it just, it just gives me more experience. Like I've, I've done it more than coaches who have only been doing this for three years. It doesn't mean that I'm always going to be right. It just means that I have more practice. Well, it's interesting that you say that, but I mean, it, and I know you're, you're very humble and you talk about like, yeah, you're just old and you just happened to be in the right place and <laughs> had the right wife at the right time and, yeah. and whatever. But I I've seen, like you mentioned in here uh, that you take every opportunity you get to handle and game day coach lifters. And I mean, you don't turn it down. I mean, I've seen it in person coming yeah. out of the front row last year in Austin to coach Lugo. Right. And I mean, and, and where you could easily, you're at a level now where you could easily be at the point where you think, Hey, my sword is sharp enough, you know, but that's what I think I love so much about you is that you, you're never done. You're never the finished product. You never think that, you know, so much that you can't learn something else. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just, I think as a coach, you have to have, you know, or as anybody who just, it's that perpetual pursuit of mastery. And mm -hmm. so you're, it's that growth mindset, also understanding that I don't know it all. I don't proclaim to know it all. I try to stay in my own lane and play to my own strengths, but even still, I feel like I can be better. And the, and, and the way for me to get better is just to avail myself of more opportunities to coach lifters from novice to elite and everybody in between. And so yeah. it's, it's my absolute passion. And so whenever I have those opportunities, I like to seize the day and do it. And, and I mean, uh, I was just at high school nationals and, um, the head coach of the U S junior and sub junior team is John Burford. 
and he's back there in the warm-up room and he's got a bunch of slew of lifters from Covington that are all studs and it's amazing to watch them work because it's like such a well-oiled machine um, but he said the same thing you know powerlifting is my passion and same thing I we, we saw in a, a situation where there was a lifter that it looked like she was, you know, trouble was on the horizon and he stepped, he kind of stepped in there and took, you know, basically he could have easily just said, Hey, you know, l- l- you know, hands off, whatever happens, happens. But just like you, you know, he, it's his passion. So he sees this unfolding in front of him and it's like, Hey, let me just give you a little bit of advice and help coach up a lifter um, that might've ended up bombing out on deadlift, you know? So. Yeah, for sure. You, you never know where a lifter is at the, in, you know, in their journey. And so I do relish those opportunities, even at, you know, um, national events, you might bump into somebody and that might be their very first nationals, you know, they may not have aspirations of winning, but they're just happy to be there. And so if you can kind of see sometimes these days or these situations, like you just pointed out, you know, are beginning to unravel, things are starting to go south. And so, you know, you can change somebody's life, man, with an encouraging word and, you know, and with just giving them a tip and it's not that you're trying to overstep your boundaries. It's just exactly. trying to, to pour positivity into the community and you can really help those people. And I, and I, and I've seen people do that firsthand, even lifters who have bombed out, you know, there was a lifter who bombed out a couple of years ago to nationals. And I went over and said something to this girl and, and so did my wife, Susie, and so did Jem Thompson. And you've got, you know, two, two females, two legends in the sport going over to this lifter and, and kind of trying to lift her spirits and say, look, you know, it, it, you bombed out in the squat, but you've still got six lifts. So yeah. let's, let's be the best bencher and deadlifter that we can possibly be and turn it around. And Susie's actually done that with a lifter before a master's lifter that bombed out in the squat. This is a true story. And that lady came back the next year to win nationals. And wow. so That's what awesome. a resurrection story, right? What, a, what yeah. a rebirth, you know, and a comeback for that person. And otherwise that person could have quit or they could have left with such a sour taste in their mouth. So anyway, you know, coaching is huge, man. It's, it's, it's pouring into the lives of other people. And, and, and I just appreciate the opportunity to do that. Yeah. And I mean, it's obvious with you and Susie. And like I said, I mean, you can see the good coaches when they're back there in the warm-up room, like I'm in there mixing, mixing it up and, and you can just kind of see like the, uh, I think really good coaches, they don't, they don't turn their nose up at an opportunity to coach like coaches coach, you know, and like, and it's like, I think that's, and I, I kind of see, I mean, there's been times when I've reached out to someone to ask, you know, will you game day coach someone or something like that? And they're like, no, I'm not interested. And, you know, I just, I always come back to the best coaches in the game. They don't do that. They, they always take that extra advantage. If you have the time and, you know, you don't have other lifters in the same flight things, there's always something going on, you know, want to be judgmental or whatever, but but yeah. I mean, I've seen it time and time again, where really great coaches, they jump in there, you know, any opportunity that they get, you're there already, like, let's coach, let's do it, you know. And, and, um, and here's, the, here's the thing, too, to your point, not to yeah. cut you off, but no, no, you, you, that might be an opportunity for me to grow as well, because I might be coaching a lifter that has a mentality or has a mindset or has a technique that I've never seen or what have you that might just blow my mind and gives me the opportunity for growth. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, in, in a, and I don't want to have an opportunity lost. And so, exactly. you know what I mean? I like to take advantage of those situations as best I can. And so that, 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 that might make me better as a coach at the end of the day. So not only are you helping that athlete and pouring into their lives, but they're, they're, they're returning it back to you and helping make you better. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that you nailed that in the book, as far as like this, this, the greatest skill is like assessing those second attempts and putting the right number on the third and assessing what your lifter has left and whatnot. And you only get that by looking at uh, more and more attempts. So every attempt you watch, you're, you are getting better. Like even, yeah. even someone as experienced as you, yeah. um, there might be, you know, diminishing returns, whatever. But, um, but uh, I also want to say what, what is your take on? So like, there's a young coach out there, let's say, um, <clears throat> who's hearing this, reading your book and they're soaking up everything. And they don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to all these amazing meets. And, and of course they can, you know, we can say like they should put in the, the, the work and go drive to local meets and whatever handle lifters. Can you get, can you gain anything from watching like live streams, watching video, um, that kind of stuff? What's your, what's your take on kind of, you know, if, if I want to become a really great game day coach, like watching live streams and, and assessing uh, second attempts based on that. 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, to your point, obviously best case scenario is you actually putting in the work, rolling up your sleeves, getting your hands dirty, doing the physical labor, getting to competitions, coaching as many lifters as you possibly can. So there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's, that is matter of factly the best thing to do to get better at game day coaching is to actually coach. It's just like, if you want to become a better competitor, you need to compete. And so, um, but if you don't have the opportunity to get to these comp competitions, yeah, to your point, going back, watching some live streams, particularly high level live streams, national championships, world championships, you know, watching these higher level meets, maybe pick out a lifter and kind of follow that lifter. And maybe, you know, now we have this incredible database, of, you know, at, at, our, at our fingertips, you know, Powerlifting America has a, a database for, for the Federation, but also obviously open powerlifting or, yeah. open, you know, or IPF or open IPF. And you can find that lifter, find out what their PBs are, and then kind of say, hey, how would I put together a game plan for that lifter or how would, or, you know, or how would I call attempts and then kind of watch the live stream. And yes, there's a little bit of a quality, obviously, that's going to be lost on a live stream on a camera. You know, it's like, I mean, you know, this is a photographer, the camera sees a flower different than the naked eye sees the flower. Absolutely. And so there's a quality that gets changed or lost. But yeah, it kind of is the next best thing, if you will. Mm -hmm. So watching a live stream and kind of playing the game from your laptop or from your device and mm -hmm. kind of seeing how would I call that and then kind of see how the, how the day goes. That's a good thing. Um, also finding mentors, you know what I mean? Finding other coaches that, that uh, you know, where, where your values align, where their coaching philosophy aligns with yours and has to be, you know, a mentee, you know, get mentorship from somebody and, um, you know, do calls like this, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and video calls and talk strategy. I mean, I do that with lifters a lot of times and with other coaches where we're talking strategies, we're looking at, at score sheets, you know, and not everything can be gleaned from a score sheet. You know, it doesn't, it clearly doesn't tell the entire story. Mm -hmm. There's a backstory to every single attempt that we're not privy to when we're just looking at a score sheet, but you can learn things from a score sheet. Yeah. Nonetheless, you can oh. look at bot lot number, you can look at body weight and you can see, oh, okay, that's why they called a low ball third, you know, on, on the final deadlift, because they were just going to tie that mm -hmm. person to, you know, to, to beat them on body weight. That's why they didn't go for a PB and stuff like that. And so you can look at these score sheets. So mentorship is a great way, looking at the live streams, studying results. I mean, you can just, you can just pick up results, you know, off the Powerlifting America website or the IPF website, what have you, and mm -hmm. just look back at meets and just study some of the attempts and look at the high performers, the ones who are making eight, eight of nine, kind of look at their attempt progressions and understand, okay, someone who squats around 200 kilos is typically taking these kinds of jumps yes. when they're successful. Oh, well, here's a lifter that squats about 200 kilos that only made one squat. Why? Well, they took a huge jump or something like that. And so, yeah. it's, you know, you can glean additional information from some of these score sheets. And so those are kind of second and third best options. But when you can compile all of that stuff, you know, that's kind of this best case scenario. And so, you know, I also encourage coaches to, to shadow other coaches. You know what I mean? Oh. If you, if you have the opportunity to shadow a, a coach on game day at a big meet or even a local meet, there's value in that as well. I mean, there's things that can be, there's things that can be learned at local meets that you're not going to learn <laughs> at national level meets or in a prime time session at worlds or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you know, learning how to share warm up racks <laughs> and, and yeah. how, to, how to navigate a warm up room, you know, practicing timing and so forth. And a lot of these things are important. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, just so people know, I mean, you have it laid out in the book how to install a game plan, you know, when you go back and you look at PBs and everything like that. And, and so you can literally take the formula from the book and, and take Matt's uh, game plan strategy and go find a lifter, put in the numbers for, for PBs and things and make some predictions and sit down and then watch the live stream and kind of watch how it plays out in front of you and see if you would make the right attempts and calls and stuff. And obviously you can slow the game down and pause yeah. and think a little and do a little extra math that you wouldn't normally get to do in 60 seconds. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that you could do just from a live stream. I do want to give like a couple, two caveats yeah. because we're talking about video. And there's one thing that's mentioned in the book many times, or at least a couple of times is just that 
looking at your lift on video is always going to look faster, right? I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is. It's always going to look faster. So I think definitely there's not going to be a substitute for seeing it in person, get a sense of the effort that went into it versus seeing a video. Um, and so that's like one of the caveats. And the second caveat you mentioned, which is just that you don't know from a live stream, because this comes, in, this comes into kind of when you're talking about um, like, for instance, someone trying to coach from home, their lifter is off in South Africa and they're watching the live stream and they're trying to assess and they're trying to call the national team head coach and say, put in these numbers, whatever. Right. But there's, you never really get a sense, the same kind of sense from a live stream as you would from being there and being in the warm up room. Yeah. And you're not, you're not privy to how the warm ups looked. You're not yeah. privy to the private conversations or the backstory for each attempt or each, yeah. you know what I mean? You're not, you're not privy to the conversations that are taking place between the other coaches between the other competitors, yeah. between them strategizing at the, at the, you know, looking at the monitor, you know, in mm -hmm. the warm up area, you're not mm -hmm. privy to those conversations. And so you're looking at everything on a live stream and you can't always see a shift, you know, the, 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 a breakdown in technique on a mm -hmm. live stream that, that might've been more obvious had you been there in person, you know what yeah. I mean? You could yeah. see a person's foot slip on a bench press or something that you may have missed on the live stream. You know, yeah. sometimes you can't always see their butt coming off the bench or something like that. You know, things of that nature that you're, you know, that they're just going to be missed. So yeah, I Absolutely. mean, preference, preference is always going to be given to the people with boots on the ground who are coaching there, you know, side by side with their lifter. Yeah, for so sure. Speaking of that, you, you just, I mean, we're, we're going off on different tangents here, but um, you know, because every time I talk to you, this is how it goes. Cause I'm always so yeah, curious to say something and it leads to another idea. Yeah. Um, how, how in tune are you, uh, how much when you're in a warm up room situation, like a PA Nats or whatever, or, or a world's event, um, how much are you watching your opponent's warm ups? Are you watching them at all? Um, are you noticing things like, Hey, look, they keep hitching at the top of their, their warmups or they keep they, their butt keeps coming off or yeah, are you I, noticing I, that they come off the bench going like, Oh, you know, my shoulder. So let me say this. My primary focus mm -hmm. is always going to be on my lifter, mm -hmm. right? The things that I can control mm -hmm. the thing, you know, and I, I talk about that in the book. I talk about having a circle of control and focusing on the things that we can control that I can control as the coach that the athlete can control. Everything on the outside of that circle is largely trivia. It's just trivial. I can't control those things. And every moment that I focus on things that are outside of my control is a moment lost or that could have been spent on my lifter. Now, we'll put a pin in that for just a second. Mm -hmm. It would also be silly of me not to be observational and not to pay attention, not to keep my head on a swivel, if you will, to be mindful of what's going on around me. Not that it's going to change our strategy. You know what I mean? If I, to your point, if I see a lifter coming up off the bench after their second or third bench warm up and they're kind of working their shoulder, I'm just mindful of the fact that they may not be able to push their limits that day. Or if I routinely see their butt coming off in the bench, I kind of file that in my memory bank, you know, and I'm like, okay, that could become an issue. And if I'm seeing it, maybe the referees are going to see that. But it's certainly not going to change our plan. Mm -hmm. Our plan is our plan. We focus on ourselves. We focus on our abilities. We focus on our lifts. We don't intentionally chase anybody. You know what I mean? If our lifter can out squat us by 50 kilos, that's not a deficit we're going to be able to make up. We mm -hmm. need to make our attempts and maybe we get lucky for us and they wind up missing an attempt or something like that. So it yeah. doesn't change our strategy, but I'm mindful of those things. I'm also mindful of those things, particularly at the, in the end of game scenarios where there might be a two to one call. You know, yeah. if I see somebody hitching in the deadlift or supporting on the thighs or that, or their deadlift is a little bit untidy, as we say, then that might be something that I want to file in my memory bank. Because if it's a two to one decision at the end of the day, and it's going to affect placing or the outcome for my lifter, you bet your bottom dollar, I'm going over to the jury table. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And 100%. That, and, and there's nothing Bush League about that. That's within the rules. That's gamesmanship. As a matter of fact, it's good sportsmanship. It's mm -hmm. incumbent upon me to be an advocate, a defense attorney, if you will, for my lifter. And I'm going to fight tooth and nail until the, you know, till the last dog is hung, so to speak, you mm -hmm. know, 
to go out there and fight for my lifter. So those are things that I would be mindful of, but it's certainly not going to change our strategy. Yeah. And, and um, I know you made uh, some posts recently and you talked to kind of about the importance of watching, being able to watch your opponent's second attempts as well. And now is that yeah. sometimes there's logistical, I mean, there, there's some logistical issues here. Like, I mean, just as a photographer, it's like, it's hard to cover everyone and see everything. And, you know, so, so how do you, how do you navigate that? It's so, it, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's really challenging. I'm not going um, to lie to primarily what you want to watch is you want to watch your lifters, your, your, your opponent's second attempt deadlift. You know, that's mm -hmm. if, if there's a single attempt to watch, you know, just like I said, the most important skill that a game day coach has got to possess is being able to call a third attempt after seeing the second if there's the most critical lift of the day, if I can only watch one, I want to watch their eighth lift, which is their second deadlift, right? Mm -hmm. Because I need to determine how much I feel my opponent has left in the tank. And so if I've done my due diligence in terms of scouting, I know what their PB is. I, I might know what their PB at a world's is versus a nationals, you know, or a home game, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And how the, there might be a differentiation between those two numbers, but I need to know that I need to, you know, presumably if they've put some of their training on Instagram or YouTube, I need to have followed that. I need to be mindful of what their heaviest lifts were in training. And then obviously take the most critical data point of all, which is how did that second deadlift look? Mm -hmm. And so to your point, you know, and then I'm trying to assess what do I think my opponent has left in the tank versus what my lifter has in the tank? And how do I strategize that and kind of leverage those two data points to my advantage, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and look, sometimes it's just, you know, the other attempt or the other lifter just has way more in the tank, which is more than what your lifter has. And yeah. that's just the name of the game. That's sports. You know yep. what I mean? Mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that, that, that's just how it is. You know, Take your sometimes L. Sometimes, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you have a Tyreek Hill on your team who can outrun everybody when he was, yeah. and you ain't going to catch him. There's exactly. Just, there's just nothing you can do. But it, but it it can become in certain situations this logistical nightmare if you're not allowed to kind of peek beyond the curtain, mm -hmm. you know, as a coach watching an opponent. Um, that's why I always urge federations at these championships and so forth. You've got to have monitors in the back at the very mm -hmm. least. So that the coaches, you know, I'm always, again, to your point, I want to get my physical eyes on the lift. So I'll do whatever is in my power to weasel my way from the behind the back curtain, kind yeah. of sticking my head out, you know, whether it's the backdrop or the curtain or what have you to get my physical eyes on that lift to see how much they have left. And when I'm shielded from that, or I'm matter of factly not allowed, then there needs to be a monitor in the back. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, if I can't do it, it's important to have an assistant, you know, and that's why at world championships, you have staffs, you have a head coach, and then you have assistants. And then maybe you've got the, the lifters programming coach who has been named an assistant or a game day coach there at the time. And so it's, it's key to leverage all those people to your advantage so that you can get eyes on the lift. You know what I mean? But yeah. so, yeah, I want to try my best to get my eyes on the lift, but to your point, sometimes it becomes a logistical nightmare. And sometimes the scores table is a long way away and it's like, or the jury table, as we saw at Sheffield, the mm -hmm. jury table was all the way on the other side of the, the stage, opposite side, yeah. on the opposite side. And so I know, you know, it made it difficult and challenging for lifter, for coaches rather to get all the way over to the other side of the platform in a timely fashion, you know, yeah. to get over there and kind of put a halt on things and say, Hey, I want to protest this lift and so forth. So, yeah. So look at, at all times, you, you, you have to be able to read and react very quickly. And to that point, you know, like we talked about before, the only way to get better at doing that is to actually do it um, yeah. time and time again. Mm -hmm. And the more that you do something, the more that you practice a skill, as you know, as a photographer, the more thousands of photos you take, the more confident you become. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just, that's it. The more, I mean, and it's the more like you, you, like the littlest things that you've, you've mentioned so many things here. Like this is all gold, but people should be taking notes throughout this. But, um, you know, you mentioned this, the, the ability to like weasel your way in. I mean, I talk about that all the time as a photojournalist. It's like, uh, my mentor always said like, you know, you don't need to have a press pass, like a gr good photojournalist finds a way to weasel in. Just like you said, that's a skill. 
right? Like that's a way where you can find, oh, there's usually a place over on the other side away from the scoring table where I can peek behind the curtain and I could get my actual eye on it, you know? And, and so like that, the logistics of how you do that and how you figure out ways, you know, the skill of delegating to other coaches, you know, handling your lifters last, you know, keeping your lifter, um, <clears throat> Get prepped and everything while you could be going and looking at this last attempt of your opponent, things like this. So there's so many little things, you know, sometimes you might find that your assistant's not, doesn't have as good of an eye as you. So you That's leave right. them back there to rub the guy's back while you you're out there, you know, the one with the eye and looking at the attempt. So there's a lot of so much stuff in there. And like you said, just practicing it and getting better at it. Yeah. And that, you know, to, to your point out of all of this and it's, um, it's one of the things that you, you you and I've talked about, and you've obviously, you've read the book, you've given me some positive feedback. You've also given me some constructive criticism, which I've appreciated. And for those of you who are listening, who are kind of on the fence with the book, and those of you who have already purchased it, I'm soon going to be re releasing some revisions. Obviously, we've just had PA Nationals. I went to the Arnold, and I went to Sheffield. And so I've got these additional scenarios that I want to include in the book. But one of the things that I'm also going to add to kind of add, add another layer of context to my argument is let's just imagine for a moment a world where there are no coaches. And so the lifters show up to these high level competitions and every single thing they have to do is on their own. So you have to look at the scoreboard, you have to load and then lift every single warm up. you have to assess your own timing and you have to figure out where you are in the placings. You have to track lot number, body weight advantage, all of these different things, who used a chip, who didn't. And then, oh, the, by the way, when it gets time to the deadlift, you have to peek from beyond the curtain and you might be the next lifter, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you, right? And so you, you're going to be watching your opponent's deadlift while also thinking about, wait a second, I need to put baby powder on my thighs and do all these things. All that is to say is that I think we understand how critical and how vital and how necessary mm -hmm. coaching is particularly at the higher levels, because when you were, if, if you were to remove the game day coaches, if we took them completely out of the picture, I guarantee you the podiums would look different. Mm, totally. Look very different because I think we all know, and I'm not going to name names, but there are lifters out there who may also be coaches themselves. You know what I mean? But there mm -hmm. are lifters out there who would be absolute basket cases without mm -hmm without a coach by their side totally. and they don't know the difference between kilos and pounds. They don't know any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't know the rules like the coaches do. And so when you remove the coaches, the outcomes would be drastically different. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to kind of the opening point too, is like, this is what makes it a sport, you know, yeah. like this is what makes it, if it's just, you're doing everything yourself and then you're going out there and we get all these subpar performances and stuff. Like it's not exciting. It's not a good product. No. Um, and so like, these are the things. And I just think it's, it's just kind of one of those things where you, you see this in local meets all the time, like people showing up and handling themselves. I mean, I saw in a high school nationals, um, I was there, you know, and these are young kids and you see someone that's just handling themselves. And I'm thinking to myself, like, my first inclination is just like, who do I know back here that can just give this guy like or, or gal just like the tiny even can take on 1% of all those things that you listed just to take one thing off their plate, like putting in the attempt, like something as simple as that. I mean, makes a massive, massive difference. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, to us, it's so obvious at this point, like right. I wouldn't even imagine yeah. trying to show up without at least probably two people with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah, it would be unconscionable to yeah. go to any kind of high level meet without a coach in your corner, you know, yeah. and at the very least, a, a handler who can at least do the rudimentary things like loading and just writing down the number and putting it in. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, yeah, I can't even imagine not, not doing that. Absolutely. So, all right, well, I'll get us a little bit back on track in just a second. One more question I have about these advantages that we talked about. Um, and I, I think about this a lot because I think body weight advantage, it's a little bit underrated um, because it does make your opponent have to lift two and a half kilos more than you. I mean, it's as simple as that. And so is there any kind of strategy in terms of like trying to get a body weight advantage? Um, do you ever have anything where you try to get people to weigh in just a little bit lighter? Well, look, I mean, because this is a body weight sport, right? And because it's contested via via your biological sex, of course, and your and your weight class, and then as you ascend through the ranks, age, right? Those yeah. are the different categories. It mass moves mass, and so the more muscle mass you have, and the larger the lifter, 
the greater your propensity and your, the greater um, you can produce force. So in theory, you want to literally be up at the limit of your weight class. Yeah. So if you're a if 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 you're a 63 kilo female, in theory, you would like to weigh 63.0, right? You want mm -hmm. to maximize that weight class. Having said that, because nobody intentionally comes in and tries to weigh 63 on the dot, yeah. <laughs> right? When 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 lifters are cutting and fitting into the weight class, you know they're going to be a little bit under 63 kilos. In theory, you want to be as high as you can. I don't know that anybody, I mean, we're seeing that now in some of these meats, right? Some yeah. of these, some of these money meats that formula. are based on, that are based on formula that are based on metric. And then of course, you know, the Sheffield, there was no advantage matter of fact, to being lighter uh, at the Sheffield. No. You were just trying to break the world record total by a higher percentage. So, um, but in some of these other meats that are metric based, um, you are seeing people who are intentionally trying to cut. So there's two, it's kind of a, this double-edged sword, right? Because in some of those meets, you will see people who will say, man, you know what? I'm not going to cut for this competition. I'm just going to go in at my walk around body weight, my habitual body weight, if you will, and be a couple kilos over the weight class limit and just lift and have fun. And you'll see great performances lots of times mm -hmm. because those lifters haven't had to cut they haven't had to water load. They haven't had to restrict and calorie count and all of these different things, you know, in the last week leading up to um, the competition during their taper. And so matter of factly, they're calling attempts and they're able to execute the plan of lifts that they probably hit in training. On the other side of that, lifters who intentionally cut to get lighter, to maximize their dot score, to maximize their good mm -hmm. lift points or what have you, when they're doing that and trying to get lighter, um, there's an advantage to being lighter there because then their score in theory will be higher, but it also lends itself to missing more lifts because they just come in lighter. They come in a little bit weaker. They mm -hmm. aren't matter, you know, you're literally and figuratively a smaller version of yourself under the bar. And yeah. so, the, the, the you know, and when I say under the bar, I'm talking about in the squat and in the bench press. And so those are the two lifts, obviously, that are most affected by body weight, where your leverages change. And so the lighter you are, while it may mean that your formula might potentially go up a few points, it also means that your ability and capacity to produce force is probably diminished. And yeah. therefore, there's a good, there's a likelihood that you're going to lift less. So it's there's kind of this balance that needs to take place. I would not advise my lifter to intentionally come in as light as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I would advise a lifter to do. And clearly anybody who's listening to this podcast, who is a novice, who is just getting into the sport, just lift it, whatever body totally. weight you are, your habitual body weight, you don't want to focus on that variable. It's one fewer variables to focus on, particularly in your first competition. It's another story. If you have prodigious strength and the opportunity to, to hit records your first couple of times out, but those, those people are few and far between. So. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's uh, I mean, that's, that was a great analogy. I mean, like you said, it's like, it, there's a trade-off you get this two and a half kilo, possibly body weight advantage on the you know final deadlift or whatever. Um, but then you're also coming in that much more dehydrated or that much less more diminished essentially. Um, but I, I just think about that because, you know, we, we've talked before about Meg Scanlon um, in the 63s, you know, at, at Worlds this year. Um, and it didn't have that great of a meet by her standards, but she ended up a three-way tie, comes down to body weight. Um, yeah. I was just pulling up the numbers. I mean, she weighed in at 61.5, yeah. which is wildly below. And then, and then I mean, that's a, that's, that's a lot below. And then the other two lifters were at 62.3 and 62.4. Yep. So they determined, so, so we look at Kira Bernardi and Iris Schulten. I mean, it was 62.3 versus 62.4. That's what determined who got second and who got third. Yeah. I'm just wondering in that specific case, if you had a weapon like Kedrick on your side yeah. and you could just like spit like for like an extra five minutes or something, you know, um, and, and come in at 62. Two instead of 62.3, you, you get second instead of, and so I was just kind of curious if that, like, as powerlifting gets more and more competitive like this, if there doesn't start to be some scouting and strategy where like, 
both of those ladies, for instance, they came in at 62.3, 62.4. Well, if I'm Kedrick and I think I can keep Meg's strength at full capacity and get her at right at 62.1 yeah, and get that body weight advantage, I don't know if that's something that anyone would ever take advantage of, but it sounds like it's not anything that you would ever really, it's like you either have the body weight advantage or you don't. It's kind of like lot number. It's kind of a little bit random. It is a little bit random because how do you know where anybody truly is? Exactly. As we're all, as we're all sitting outside the weigh-in room, how yeah. do I know where my other two <laughs> chief rivals are? You know, yeah. where, are they, where, where are they sitting? It's not yeah. like we all kind of got on the scale before getting on the scale. Yeah. And I was like, oh, snap, I can go ahead and spit out another, you know, two grams or whatever. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so anyway. It's um, interesting though. All right, so yeah, that was that was just uh, something that I had it like you know the rolling around my head. I wanted to get it from the master. Um, so okay, let's get into Sheffield. All right. Um, yeah. So we'll do like a little, little bit of a Sheffield recap. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about from from so unless there's anything else that you want to mention about the book that we didn't hit on, I think we hit on a lot of the game day stuff. Yeah, man. I think we I think we covered all the bases, and anything that's going to be added is just going to be born out of our conversation. From yeah, Sheffield. absolutely. So, um, so first thing I wanted to ask you about was just sort of like big picture stuff, like bird's eye view of Sheffield, your experience there, what this event means for the sport of powerlifting, and you know, like what stood out, what was different that you'd like to see more of. So I know that's a lot. By, yeah, yeah, it's a lot. But let me let me start by <laughs> let me let me start by saying. I've been involved in this sport for 28 years, and I've been blessed with the opportunity to go to, you know, clearly I don't know how many meets I've been to, but just to put it in perspective, I've been to 22 world championships, 16 of which have been overseas. Mm -hmm. I've been to uh, every single Arnold Sports Festival since USA Powerlifting took over in 2008. So I haven't missed an Arnold since 2008. I've been to one world games in Kaohsiung, Taiwan in 2009. And I've been to more national championships than I can possibly count. Mm -hmm. so, some years I may have gone to two or three national championships because it, I may have been to raw and equipped and then masters and open and one, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. all those meets. Sheffield was without question the single greatest powerlifting event I have ever been to and it wasn't even close period yeah I feel the same because way just watching it it yeah this event was next level at every single facet of the of, of the show and it, and it truly was a show the, if I could distill this down into a single sentence and I wrote this down this felt like an event full of performances that also happened to be a powerlifting competition. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean by that. This was at a place called Sheffield or at City Hall in Sheffield. This was not your typical venue. This was a theater like an opera house, a place that you would go to see an orchestra or a concert or a play or something like that. I Googled the seating capacity. The seating capacity for Sheffield is 2,271, so 2,271. I know for a fact that Pete Spence and SBD sold 1,700 tickets in advance, and I believe they had about 2,000 people there. So I think it's safe to say it was about 10% vacancy of the seats. And when I kind of look back in the theater, that felt about right. Mm -hmm. It felt like it was about 90% capacity. So there were about 2,000 people there. At all the world championships that I've been to, including those Arnolds, including the World Games, there has never been a crowd of 2,000 people watching a powerlifting event. I can guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. The only time is maybe at the Arnold in the expo. But then when you're on the stage, half the people in the expo aren't even paying any attention to Yeah, you. exactly. They're not there for that. They just happen to be walking by. Exactly right. And even in the ballrooms at the Arnold, um, they don't have that capacity. So while it may be standing room only, it doesn't have that same feel of, holy crap, you're walking out onto a stage and there's this sea of 2,000 people there cheering and screaming for you. you your ticket to enter the venue looked like, a, 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 you know, I, I took pictures of it, a mm -hmm. ticket that you would receive to go to a concert, like literally a concert, because it was printed by the Sheffield City Hall 
there was a program waiting for you on every single seat in the theater. And then Pete Spence and SBD, they kind of also added this extra thing, which you saw on the live stream. They put glow sticks out there. Mm -hmm. And right before the competition started, they brought the house lights down that everybody break open their glow sticks. And you've got this, you felt like you were at a concert. I mean, yeah, like yeah. At a music festival or a rave or something. And people mm -hmm. were swinging their glow sticks. And the, the quality of the video production um, was just like nothing I've ever seen. Um, and it, it just, on every single le level, it, this was a grand slam. Can, can SBD improve? Can they make it better? Of course they can. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This is the first time, this is the first iteration. I've spoken to those guys. I've had some behind the scenes conversation. Clearly, you know, they're perfectionists. They want to do this better. They want to improve upon it. And, and hey, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to have some hiccups. You know yeah. what I mean? There's people that have complained about the sound quality on the live stream. And yep, they're aware of that. And they're going to take steps to try to fix those things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and there were some logistical things, you know, behind the scenes with kind of the getting the lifters upstairs. So for those of you who don't know this, I mean, again, this is a theater. So the warm-up rooms were downstairs in the basement. But here's the cool thing, because I was able to take a tour of this theater and be privy to all this stuff behind the scenes. You had a men's and women's warm-up room and you, you had you know 12 men, 12 women. So you had four stations, four Alico racks in each warm-up room. So three lifters per rack. Mm -hmm. And there was a assigned, uh, instead of assigned seating, there was assigned warming up. You were assigned to a certain warm-up platform and SBD intentionally paired you up with people that were of relatively the same strength, relatively the same height when they could pair mm -hmm. you by height and people who you weren't competing directly against in your own weight class. So for instance, I think Bonica, Jess Bittner and Amanda Lawrence warmed up together. Okay, and so yeah. you've got three lifters of, you know, in some of the disciplines, relatively, you know, close strength level and so forth, same height and so forth. And then at, at every platform in the warm-up room, there was uh, spotters and loaders. So the coaches didn't even have to lift a finger. All they yeah. had to do was, was call to the spotters and loaders and say, we want 170 kilos on the bar, rack height nine, we're going to take it in two minutes. And they would go ahead and do everything. I mean, you're talking about white glove service, literally, you know, for the lifters. And they were able to warm up there. And so, and then the warm up area was separated by this actually what appeared to be like a dance floor. And that's where the meet and greet took place after the event. So okay. anybody who had VIP tickets and who had VIP seating was able to attend this meet and greet. And then you had these literally these life-size posters and banners and every lifter at the meet and greet was intentionally standing right in front of their own picture. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which was yeah. like the coolest thing, right? It was like, yeah. you, you kind of hopped around from booth to booth and you were able to go meet the lifters and take photos with them and talk to them and congratulate them on their performances. And it's so on every level, man, SBD just knocked this thing clear out of the park. And so I can't, I literally can't, there are not enough superlatives yeah. to, to high five them and to pat them on the back. This was truly a one of a kind event and, and simply the greatest competition I have ever been to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's dude, it sounds so amazing. I mean, I'm uh, just like kicking myself that I didn't just pay for it myself and go over there. And I think next year you're going to see there's, oh, they're yeah. going to sell out. They're going to sell out for sure. Yeah. And so, and just to put it, just to add one thing before we get into some additional conversation at the, so people are coming down to us in the audience, you know, Susie and I were blessed. We were fortunate enough to be in the front row. We were sitting there. And so before the event actually started, you know, they opened up the event. First of all, they had you, you, you could get adult beverages. So there were bars that were open. There was awesome. food available in this theater, which That's was awesome. really cool. Like how often do you have that stuff? And so you yeah. could go grab a cocktail or a beer or, or a soda or whatever, come back to your seat. And people were kind of mingling around the theater. Yeah. And we had on our SSBT t-shirts. And so people were coming down and saying hello. And we were able to get these, you know, photo opportunities with, with our powerlifting family and stuff like that. And so that was just amazing and wonderful. And then there were people who flew from other countries all around the world. I get into the, I'm downstairs at the meet and greet and I look over to my left and I'm like, holy crap, I saw two Americans. And I'm like, what the heck are you guys doing here? Like, that's awesome. Yeah, this couple, 
they're like, well, we, we didn't want to miss it. So they bought tickets and came over to England just for this event. And that's why, again, as I said, it truly felt like an event with performances mm -hmm. that also happened to be a powerlifting competition. Because you had people, and, and, and that wasn't the only instance, you had people traveling from Spain and people from all over the world you know, coming to watch this thing. And, and also the cool thing was the majority of the audience you could tell was knowledgeable. You know, mm -hmm. a lot yeah, of the way they were, were booing and, and yes. yeah, yeah. They, they, you know, so they were, they were clearly invested because they understood what was going on. And so that's always cool too, is when you understand, you know, when your audience understands what they're watching. I mean, it's just, it's, it just reminds me, I mean, of course I'm from Nebraska. We're crazy about football, you know, yeah. and it just reminds me so much of things that you see in football where it's like, if the refs make a bad call, they will be booed for the whole rest of the game. I mean, <laughs> and I, I love, or, or on the other hand, when they make a good call, they're cheering yeah. or like, or like if they're, the lights are taking forever, you know, it's kind of like a field goal kicker that keeps missing. And then they sarcastically cheer when they finally make one. Like you could <laughs> see that happening where they're like, you know, like, yeah. oh, good job. You got the calls, you know, the lights to work actually right, in, a, right. in a timely manner, um, yeah. things like that. Um, I thought about that a lot too, just kind of thinking of ideas about Sheffield um, and, and, you know, stealing. And then this is what SBD has done is like, they've reimagined what powerlifting is. They've, they've got us all thinking now in a different way. Um, it's kind of like, I know, you know, like we're both friends with Ryan Lapp and I, we talk about like what happened when someone breaks a four minute mile, you know, it's like, like they just broke the four minute mile in powerlifting. Yeah. And yep. now we're all thinking, wow, the possibilities from here, like our minds are racing of all the ways, of course, yes, you can improve you, the, the things that we can do at PA nationals that are, the, you know, that we can take ideas from Sheffield you know, ways to improve it, but none of that would happen. The conversation wouldn't be happening if they just did another meet that was just like all the other meets that we've seen, or just like IPF worlds or whatever. Um, so, I mean, obviously massive kudos and hats off to them. So whatever kind of, uh, critiques or constructive criticism that we would give, it would only be from a place of, oh. of overwhelming gratitude that they did this yeah. to begin with. The, the, they're boundary pushers and trendsetters, because like you said, this is the new standard now. And yeah. so it's like, this is, this is what people want to mimic and, and imitation is the highest form of flattery. And so people will look at this and say, ha, well, look at what they did. Now let me do some of that. It's just like with you yeah. and powerlifting America, creating these post-game press conferences. It's brilliant. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. brilliant. It aggregates more eyeballs in the sport and it gets the, the audience and other lifters and coaches more invested because you, yeah. you suck somebody in and you intentionally create a relationship between the audience and the athletes and the coaches. And it's great. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we got nothing but great, really great things to say about it. Um, do you think, how, how do you think this changes the game for powerlifting? I mean, do you see that this is going to make us more palatable for things like IOC recognition or for, I mean, I think for sure, when you, when you take this and you show it to a major company, like a major brand, like, like a, a car company or something that we want to get these kind of big sponsors, this shows you can fill stadiums. I mean, you can fill, you can fill rooms. No, no doubt. And, 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 and just the, the quality and the production level was at an all time high. And yeah. so it's, it, it's, it's the little finishing touches that were nice. It was, it was being able to see a, a live scoreboard or a live update after the first round of, you know, after the first round of squats, you saw it go up for the women. You saw it go up for the men. Hey, these are the current standings. You know what I mean? This is what it's looking like. And so them being able to flash to that um, during uh, the in-between, the rest bake between the disciplines, they put up uh, video footage of some of the, the press conferences and the interviews, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, they did some pregame interviews the days yeah. before and the days leading up. They aired some of that. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was nice to be able to see those sorts of things and look, they can expand upon that. It might be cool to, you know, do some training footage stuff or some highlights and, you know, whatever, you know, so you saw things. the road, to, you, there's so many things it's yeah. endless. You saw the road to Sheffield videos and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, that builds relationship and builds community and builds interest. And, and, you know, when you can latch on to somebody's story and say, ah, you know, I'm cheering for that person because of that. So yeah, it's, it does. It makes it more palatable to the to the public and more attractive to potential sponsors, and it legitimizes us, right? It yeah. just it it makes us look, you know, more professional. This isn't some, you know, what I mean, one off, you know, strength extravaganza at, at a barbecue or a cookout. Like this is a real freaking event, man. 
Like, yeah. So yeah, I, I I think it's great. And so just you know, on 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 so many levels, and and again, it's not hyperbole, but it's the truth. I mean that with all my heart. This is the best event I've ever been to, and and I expect it to get better. And that's not to put pressure on them. It's just I'm confident. It's like look what they've yeah. done. Now they say, okay, we've got these three, four, five areas that we think we can improve upon, and they'll get better. And so yeah. every year, you know, like you said, if you come next year, you'll probably be able to see a product that was better than what I saw. You know what I mean? So it's, it's yeah. really cool. I had an idea going into it because I was, I was kind of kicking myself. I didn't bite six. I'm like, man, I wish I was sitting next to Matt and Susie and just yeah. like soaking up what you were saying. And then I had the idea of we need to mic up Matt at this meet Absolutely. and have him, we get him fully mic'd the whole time and get oh, like a, man. after the fact commentary of like, you know, yeah. you know how they do that in football games where oh. they mic people up and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, again, yeah. hats off to them because, you were having these ideas and things because of, of what they did. And I just think, I mean, who knows where we can go from here. It's yeah. been, and then the other thing I was going to say, I've been talking, I've been mentioning this a lot is like, I think our athletes are superstars that are out here. You know, these, I think they deserve this sort of treatment, you know, that they deserve this stage for them to shine on and, um, and to be treated like rock stars, to be yeah. have like the big poster and to be signing. It reminds me, you know, of uh, like a fan day at a college football game where everyone can come and get their program signed by your favorite athlete and talk with them for a couple minutes and things like that. Um, and I think, and we saw as well that, that big stage, they rose to the occasion, you know, yeah. the, these, the, that's our biggest, that's our best, our biggest commodity, our best product, our biggest asset or whatever is Jesus, Amanda, you know, uh, Evie, you know, all these amazing athletes and SBD has finally, you know, found a way to sort of package that all up and bottle it up right. in just the right way. Um, so yeah, I just, did you feel that way as well? Like the, the athletes kind of like rose oh. to the, to this, the size of the stage. Yes. I, I have not talked to a single lifter and I talked to most of them and then, mm -hmm. and, and ones from other countries that I'm friends with as well. And they all felt like they were treated like royalty. I mean, in addition to their, their travel and accommodations being paid for when they arrived there, they all had itineraries. Each of them had an individual itinerary of this is when your photo shoot is going to be. These are when your videos are taking place um, over the next couple of days. We're going to be going over to the theater as a group to kind of navigate and get a lay of the land. You're going to get to see the, the stage, the warm-up room, all these different things. Like you said, yeah. all of their meals were taken care of and they ate together as a group. You know, That's they, cool. they, they, they broke bread together and what better way to build relationship and is to have fellowship over food with people. I mean, you Absolutely. and I know that firsthand. And that's how you and I got to know each other better, yeah. you know, at PA Nationals. And so, yeah. And, and, and to your point, I think all the lifters appreciated that they appreciated the attention. They appreciated this, this literal and figurative red carpet being rolled out for them. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, they rose to the occasion, you know, they realized this opportunity that they had to kind of interact with the audience and whatever you, you gave, you got back. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, you know, Gavin, obviously, I mean, with braiding his hair and looking like a Viking, like yeah. he, he intentionally like leaned into that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, and it, and it's cool. And it's okay. If your personality's not like that, you know, if you're a little bit more stoic or something like a, like a Jonathan Keiko, that's fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but still, you know, I mean, e even, you know, I think you saw in the live stream after Gavin's third attempt deadlift and then Keiko needed that third pull and they yeah. locked in on him. Yeah. Which, now that thing's gone viral. You yeah. Know, it's amazing. Fun. It's amazing. Right. It's just him just like breathe. You can see him breathing fire almost like, you yeah. know, so intense and so locked you in. Mean. So, yeah. It's, it's so, and it's these moments, right that like you said, other sponsors, other corporations, hopefully, you know, Lord willing, will see and realize, wow, you know, th there, there's a product here that maybe I want to be a part of. And so, yeah, I think all the athletes that I spoke to were very appreciative of that. And they rose to the occasion. Totally. And, uh, and I think it was just is kind of like about time in a way where it's like, you know, these athletes, they, 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 to go to, to worlds, you know, you got to buy your own track to pay for your own drug tests and pay for your flight, you know, so I mean, of course, yeah, SVD also sponsors a lot of athletes and covers some of their travel costs and whatnot for IPF worlds and things as, as, as well. But I mean, there is a lot of out of pocket expenses. And I like that this was basically like everything covered food, everything, everything's taken care of. And you mentioned doing the tour of the stage before. I mean, that's just like, you can just imagine like a band 
doing yeah. like the, 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 the walk through, you know, yeah. the, the tune up or whatever, you know, that they do the rehearsal, yeah. um, that a band would do. And I, I just think it's so fitting for these, you know, rock stars of powerlifting to be treated in that same kind of way. And I think they appreciate it. I think it, it's helped them also reimagine where the sport, you know, reinvigorate fire in them. Someone like a Kaiko, we saw him, he was actually celebrating doing little dance moves and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. that's, yeah. that's not like him, you know? No, right. Um, right. And so yeah. I don't think you ever see him, you know, he's doing a lot of, you know, yeah. fun, fun stuff. And so totally. yeah. and I think, and then, like you said, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and then you've got somebody like a, like a Delaney Wallace, right. Who's a, yeah. who's a showman and who yeah. like, you know what I mean? And he, he yeah. was doing a little salsa on stage and stuff. And yeah. so he's just, you know, you, you get into his pre-lift ritual and, you know, you're expecting that. And it just adds this spice, which adds flavor to the competition. And so there's, there's something for everybody to see there because you've got 24 lifters with 24 different personalities. Yeah. And so like you can kind of intentionally, you know, and then, and then, like we said, when you know a lifter's backstory, you can really become invested in these performances and cheer for people. And so it's just, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. My mom was like, I like his shoes. Uh, talking to Delaney had yeah. on those silver shoes. He was like, Oh, what's up with this guy's hair talking about Gavin, you know, yeah. it just, the, the kind of same kind of commentary that she gives me because well, she was recently here and I put it on the, the big screen and we we're watching. I'm like, this is what it's all about. And, and she was getting into it and uh, similar kind of comments that she would talk during football or a basketball game, talking about people's hair and stuff in their shoes. But it, yeah, it, super it makes cool. people, it makes, you know, Ryan says this all the time. It makes people care. And yep. So it, mm -hmm. that's it. it. It, you then become invested, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and, and so you can kind of pick your flavor and, and latch onto the competitors that you like and, and, and there's no harm for cheering for different people for different reasons. And so it's, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. And I, I mean, I, I always make this comment of like, kind of like, you know, if we don't do this for our athletes, then why would anyone else, you know, um, why would a big corporation come in and, and bankroll a stadium and a platform and all lighting and all this high production, like a Super Bowl type of event, you yeah. know, if we're not doing it ourselves, if we can't, we'll sort of show proof of concept, if you will, you know, so yeah, I think exactly. that they did an amazing job with that. Okay, so yep. let's briefly kind of kind of, you know, what what were some of your takeaways from the actual competition itself, like, like from, you know, all the lights and the the the, you know, cameras and everything like that. Um, put that aside. And let's just talk like powerlifting again. Um, yep. And so do you have some ideas, you know, give us your kind of off the top take on the performances well look clearly unless you're living you've been living under a rock the two <laughs> biggest stories of this competition were matter of factly evie you know it's about the winners right it's evie mm -hmm. corrigan um coming as this dark horse out of new zealand as literally and figuratively having this sneak attack you know she's known as this 57 kilo lifter She's the regional invitee that nobody's paying any attention to whatsoever. You know, um, there was that website, powerliftingdata.com that enabled yeah. you to enter those metrics and generate your own version of how you thought this might play out. And I think everybody but her and her team probably had her ranked at the bottom, somewhere yeah. near 12th. You know, nobody saw this coming. And they had planned it all along. She and her coach, Jason Clark, um, studied the opposition. They looked at the world records that were available in like, you know, two to three different weight classes. What, what can we do if we stay at 57? What's potentially there at, at 52 if we go down? And Lord knows if we move up, we have to contend with an even bigger total at 63. And he mm -hmm. kind of ran the numbers and ran the data and said, look, you know, you're kind of walking around at this habitual body weight, you know, that's within striking distance of us comfortably getting down to 52. And so if you've listen to some of the podcasts that she's been on. Yeah. This was their plan all along. And they were able to keep a lid on it up until right about the end there. And so, and then she comes out and credit to, you know, like I said, credit to Kedrick Kwan, who wrote the, the making weight chapter in my book, who handled her nutrition and handled her, her cut and all that sort of thing. And, you know, she has said that she got down to about 55 kilos on her own. And she did that by herself and she was miserable and she was grumpy. And then she, invested in, in the services of, of, of Kedrick Kwan and reformance training. And, and it all became easy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, and, she, mm -hmm. and she gets down and she pretty much coasts into the competition with just a very minor amount of cutting at the very end. And then she and her coach implement a strategy that is sound, that is safe, that is pragmatic, 
that builds the total and she makes all nine lifts. She goes out like a, and has a surgical performance. Yeah. Right? Surgically executes this performance, both in attempt selection and then of course execution and goes nine for nine and, set, and, and puts up the biggest 52 kilo total we have ever seen just and 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 knocks it so far completely out of the park so yeah. clearly for the ladies you know and and, and she was i mean she, her world record total was five percent over the world record that was i mean that's if, crazy if we took all 24 lifters she's the best she's the best of the best mm-hmm. right so clearly she's the storyline for the ladies and then of course on the other side we have jesus olivares who in a sport where the name of the game is lifting the most weight possible. We have a human being do what we thought before was unthinkable, unimaginable. And so we're talking about under the strictest of conditions, an IPF competition. Now he doesn't have to worry about a two hour weigh in because he's a super, but still a two hour weigh in, right? A stiff bar, the, the highest performance standards that you can possibly have. And then this guy goes ham. You know what I mean? He he yeah. he goes nine for nine and knocks it completely out of the park and puts up matter of factly the biggest raw total that the sport has ever seen. And oh, by the way, was drug tested moments after the competition. So yeah. anybody who's wondering about that sort of thing, all the lifters were drug tested. And so yeah. he puts together this this performance that is like in another galaxy. It's just it's just incredible. And so hats off to him and his team. Um, you know, he did the same thing that Evie Corrigan did. And it makes me very oh so happy to see, obviously, when you have the underlying theme of my book is building a total and trying to go nine for nine. You have the two champions of Sheffield both go nine for nine. And yeah. so if that doesn't lend credence to my argument of building a total and making every attempt, I don't know what does. Uh, 100%. And I mean, I think in the in the meet as a whole, the whole competition, only four lifters went nine for nine, and yeah. 50% of them are winners. So yeah. are the winners. So I mean, I think if you want to increase your odds of winning, you go nine for nine, you got a 50 50 shot at uh, walking yeah. away with the title here, basically. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think I think that makes a ton of sense. And obviously, like I was I rewatched um, the women's side earlier today. Oh, and um, you're you're absolutely dead on with Evie. I mean, her coaching her, her those attempts and, and i mean she's so smart herself like she's she's you know so she probably knows herself really well what she's capable of but the attempts were so on point and to be able to do that at a new body weight with cuts and stuff and not knowing you know how are the cuts going to affect you and on this and that it the, it's the level of difficulty like if you're in gymnastics or whatever like this is a 10 this is a a very lo- high level of difficulty to come in against a murderer's row of women, you know, the greatest world champions of sport I've ever seen and perform like this on the biggest stage and just yeah, can't, can't give her enough credit. Yeah, exactly. She, she deserves every heap of praise, every affirmation, every accolade. She's the champion of champions. She, yeah. I mean, she, yeah, it, it was, it was unbelievable. And I'm just thrilled and ecstatic for her. And then we all get to see the two of these ladies, her and Noemi run it back here in Malta. You know what I mean? And yeah, so that's, yeah. that, that, that's going to be exciting as well is seeing the two of them go at it. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. it was, it was, it was fun to, to meet those two ladies at the meet and greet and just talk with both of them. And uh, I know they're excited to clash again. And it's just, I mean, look, it came down to the very last deadlift and Noemi yeah. had the winning deadlift in her, in her hands, but mm-hmm. it was just too much. And and look, that's what you want to see, right? Yep. As a, as a, as someone who genuinely loves this sport, you don't, you want to see people competing at the highest level. And that's what you want to see. I always use the analogy, you know, and that's the beauty of the camaraderie, the fraternity and sorority that exists within the sport of powerlifting is that we all understand how hard it is to lift these heavy ass weights. And I don't want you to miss, I just want to lift more. Mm -hmm. And so we see two people go, you know, eight for eight. And then, you know, Evie takes her ninth attempt and forces Noemi to take a weight that she just couldn't quite, you know, get and so forth. And that's what you want to see. You want to see two lifters battling it out like that at the highest level of competition with a lot of made lifts. You don't want to see one of them go nine for nine and the other one only makes five attempts. That's yeah. not good lifting. And then they, you know, that that's essentially a blowout. That's a and blowout. Exactly. That's a blowout. And, and, that, and that's no fun. 
you don't want to see that. And so you matter of factly should cheer for lifters to make lifts and want them to, you know, execute at such a high level. And, and, and Evie did that. And so she, yeah, just deserves all the credit. She and totally. her, her team of coaches. So. And she just seems like a great person, a huge asset wow. to the sport. I think I actually mistakenly said that she was voted as the president of uh, New Zealand powerlifting. It's actually the Auckland powerlifting federation. So I believe that's like the city that she's in. Yep. Um, but still, I mean, I, I, I had heard the podcast about how she did so much at the Commonwealth games to run that event and then yeah. co coached lifters and then competed in it and just, just seems like an amazing person. So you couldn't, it couldn't have happened to a better person. So Amen. Uh, really cool hats off to her. Um, so overall it, the women broke eight total world records. Yep. Um, uh, the men only broke three. So uh, hats off to the women. They came out yeah. and executed and they, they just, they broke a ton of individual lift world records. I mean, you mentioned, uh, powerlifting data. Um, they still have the post up where you can see all the world records and get like a visual, you know, and there's a ton of red, which is what they use to mark the world records, um, on the women's side, on the men's side, not as much. I mean, um, you know, the, the individual lifts it's Jesus, um, with the deadlift and Keiko with the bench. And then that was, that was pretty much it. And then it was a, a three total world records broken Gavin Keiko and, and Jesus, but on the women's side, I mean, it's like just tons of, of world records broken left and right across all different disciplines. Yeah. The women's competition was a lot tighter. As you mm -hmm. said, eight of them broke world records to only three on the men's side. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. So, so in, in that regard, not, not that the men's was, you know, less exciting, but because of the volume of world records that were broken on the women's side, you know, mm -hmm. that, and, 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 and because that was matter of factly the name of the game on the day, you know, the, the, it, it was more exciting in that way. And so yeah. it, 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 it became really tight there. And, um, you know, it came down to the end in a lot of these battles. And, um, you know, we talk, I talk about it in my book where, you know, 50% of lifters missed their third deadlifts. And at this competition, we saw um, a lot of misses. We saw 16 out of 24 attempts get missed. And so that's, that's two thirds. That's more, you know, that's more than usual. And so, and understandably so, I mean, at a competition of this magnitude where there's really no consequence for essentially losing, if you will, other than you're losing out on money, you know what yeah. I mean? That sort of thing. It's not like you're losing out on a world title or a podium placing or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You can be more aggressive. You can swing for the fences a little bit more and yeah. so forth. And so understandably so, you know, and, and obviously where there was individual payouts, for world records, you're going to see lifters trying to be, you know, a little bit more aggressive at the end. And, you know, when you do that, obviously the data is the data that, the, you know, the, the facts don't care about your feelings. Yep. <laughs> and so um, when, when you do that, you're, you're going to tend to be less successful. And so I think that's why we saw so many misses at the end. Yeah, They were pushing to the limits um, yeah. as far as, so you were, you were talking, those numbers were based on um, out of the total number of third attempt deadlifts, yep. how many were missed? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had one. We had one pass. We had Agatha pass her 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 third yeah. deadlift because I think at that point, you know, the kind of the 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 proverbial writing was on the wall, so to speak. I mean, she came in. It's well documented. She was less than her best. She was kind of injured, etc. I think mm -hmm. at that point, she kind of realized, look, the low hanging fruit for me is the is the bench world record. Let me try to grab that money if I can. Thank God she made her third bench attempt because she missed the first two on technicalities and so forth. Oh, God. Clearly wasn't a strength issue. It was a technicality issue. Yeah. And so, you know, excited to see her be able to walk away with the bench record, but she passed on her third deadlift. And, but there were, yeah, there was a sea of red in terms of the third deadlifts. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, you, you, you'd like to see more makes at the end, but understandable, you know, you understand why there were a lot of misses. Yeah, I mean, they're swinging for, you know, the fences, yeah. like you said, and you're going to strike totally. out a lot when you do that. Yep, um, for as sure. As opposed to trying to hit singles. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I think overall, the the women missed 23 lifts, the men missed 27. Um, yep. And that kind of fits right in there. You're going to get more shots at breaking more world records if you make more lifts. So, right. I mean, it kind of it goes hand in hand. You're going to see more made. We're, the women made more lifts. They broke more world records. They broke more yep. total world record, build a bigger, bigger totals. Yep. So there you go. Um, it makes I, sense. And I, I still, mean, I mean, look, we can talk about that until we're blue in the face. Yeah. I still favor this format. I still favor the way that SBD intentionally structured this event, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, you know, and, you know, it doesn't matter what metric you use. And look, I've been around for every damn one of them almost, it seems like. Mm -hmm. I mean, dating back to like the Glossbrenner formula. And like, we've seen 
two versions and iterations of Wilkes and then good lift points and IPF and dots and yada, yada, yada. No matter which metric we use, right? It's going to favor one, you know, dots seems to be the most fair, but yeah. still it's going to favor certain weight classes. Well, this is the fairest because it's, you weren't even invited to the dinner, to the party, if you will, unless you had a total that was within 95% of the world record. You weren't yeah. even allowed to, to attend and you had to be a world champion. So it's all killer and no filler, as they say. And so yeah. it's, it, yeah, this is the fairest way to, mm -hmm. to, to do it. And um, yeah, it, it, it also, this style of competition by its very nature incentivizes challenges, right? It yeah. incentivizes being on your game, understanding the rules. How can I leverage these protests to my advantage? You know, SBD had, look, they had private meetings before the thing even unfolded. You had to have a written document, you know, in your pocket or in your hand when you walked over to the jury, in addition to the customary 75 euro, which is to put down, you know, mm -hmm. when you have a protest to, 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 to legitimize the fact that you were protesting a lift. So it, um, yeah, but the nature of a competition like this incentivizes challenges and it incentivizes high level coaching. And so, you know, look, if you want for people who are complaining about protests, execute to a higher standard. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that is always going to be your comeback, your retort, right? Yep. Take it out of the referee's hands whenever you can. Execute, you execute your lifts to an irrefutable standard. It doesn't mean that you need to put your ass on your ankles when you squat, but what it means is break parallel and do it convincingly. Yep. Pause your benches, achieve the sufficient elbow depth and lock out your deadlifts. And when you do that, you put yourself in a position that is essentially beyond reproach or as close to beyond reproach as possible. And you're taking it out of their hands. And, and, and it puts you, the lifter, in control because you're taking away somebody else's opportunity to protest your lift. Because as you know, if you have a white, if you have a lift that's all three white lights, then you can't protest it. So yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, so as far as individual performances and strategy and things like this, what, was there anything that stood out? Um, you know, I, I made a big list of stuff, but, but yep. um, you know, was there anything as far as like, like game day stuff that, um, that you think like played out? Like, so like one of the questions that I had, or if you have anything off the top of your head, go ahead. And then yeah, if, no, if I'll, I'll kind of let you dive into the questions and feed, I'll feed off of you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, the question, the, one of the questions that I had, you know, obviously I'm a little more focused on the American lifters, of course, um, was, yeah. What's, um, when we looking at Gavin's attempts and we looked at his third squat. Okay. So we talked before about, you know, chips and, you know, adding a chip, which he did, he put a chip on there and everything. Like we talked, you know, we could talk to this kind of at the beginning, but there's also a section in the book about, taking the minimum amount necessary to win. And so, and, and in this case, you want to win the squat because you're going to get six grand or whatever, 5,000 pounds converts to. Um, so, so taking the minimum to get that. And then is there a question of, you know, if he was capable, because I mean, he obviously was capable of putting, you know, of hitting that squat. I mean, he had the strength to do it. Um, is there any thinking that maybe he should have tried to just chip the world record on his second and then move into a bigger position to kind of go for the total for, to, to compete against Keiko or how would you have handled that situation? So there's, so I think, I think Kevin, I think Gavin made the correct decision to go for his world record on his third attempt. Okay. I just, if I were his coach, I would, and I, and, and look, I preface this by saying, I love Gavin. Gavin yes. is a friend of, great dude. Love the guy. We both love do. his personality, love his mentality. Um, I get it. And, and that, that's his personality and that makes sense to him. And so you don't want to change him as a person. Having said that, I would have tried to encourage him to take a smaller third attempt. And here's why. Just because his resume is now showing that on these third attempts, because now it's been twice in a row, right? It's been in South Africa and it's been here. As mm -hmm. the weight goes up, for whatever reason, he's not meeting the standard. So whether it's, look, and we can say it's, 
you know, he said in some podcasts that he felt like he squatted as deep as he possibly could have. Mm-hmm. He felt his hamstrings on his calves and he doesn't feel like he could have gone any lower. And that may be the case. Maybe he physically feels like I couldn't have gone any lower. The fact of the matter is you have three people in that room to convince. And it's not, it's not the coach. It's not Matt Gary sitting in the front row. It's not the thousands of people turning in on a live stream. It's three people sitting in those referees chairs. Yeah. And those three people have the best view or should have positioned themselves right to view the lift unobstructed and 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 they have the best seats in the house and are they going to get it wrong sometimes yeah they're human they're fallible they make mistakes but most of the time the referees get it right most of the time Mm -hmm. and so but we've seen now at the past two meets that as the weight goes up gavin squats higher and doesn't meet the standard and so i would have tried to convince him as his game day coach to take perhaps a smaller number. So you saw another guy um, from Algeria, Amar Kanane, who was in running for um, the squat. And so for the squat world record, now we know, you know, looking at the results, Amar missed his second attempt. I believe he was called on depth with 327 and a half. He decided to push his chips to the center of the table and go up to the world record on his third attempt. Anyway, the world record in the squat at 93 kilos going into this meet was 331 kilos. For anybody that's listening. Mm -hmm. And so Gavin could have, in theory, taken a smaller number. Now, Gavin um, did not have lot number advantage over Amar. So let's say that Gavin had put in the absolute minimum, which Mm -hmm. would have been 331.5 kilos. Mm -hmm. Strategically, what Amar would have then done, or at least I would hope that he and his coaches would be to match that attempt, would say, you know what, we've got the higher lot number, we're going to call 331.5 as well. And then by rule, and I talk about this in my book, if Gavin were to make that lift and secure the world record, you can't then have two people take the same number and have the same world record, that you, that's not allowed by rule. Then yeah. Amar's lift would have automatically been chipped up to the next smallest increment, which would have then been 332 kilos. Now, if Gavin had missed the 331.5, either on technicality or on strength, Amar would have been there with 331 and a half. So anyway, look, hindsight is always going to be 2020. Of course. I think we all saw on the live stream, Gavin is clearly strong enough to squat what he put on the bar. He just has to meet the standard and matter of factly go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the front row and I was sitting... When you see the replay on the live stream, that live stream angle, um, which if you imagine yourself as the lifter is kind of like a if, if you're at the center of the clock as the lifter, it's kind of that 10 o'clock viewpoint. So wherever that live stream camera was, that's where I was seated. I was right behind the live stream camera and I stood up for his attempt and I thought his left hip was parallel at best. So okay. I but now. That's why they have three referees. He got the lift, as we know, two to one. And then it's been well documented that, that, that the TSG team of coaches, which was Ben Escrow, came over and started to protest. But it had already been in the process of being overturned by the jury by the before jury. Ben even got to the table. Yeah. And so they were going to overturn it because they, they were privy to that live stream view and watching it again, the replay. And they now use replay at the IPF level and they overturned it. So again, look, hindsight's always going to be 2020. We can Monday, Monday morning quarterback this all we want. Yeah. I would have tried as his coach to convince him to take a smaller number. But I think, look, credit to Gavin. Um, he's a hell of a talent in this sport. The yeah. writing is the writing is on the wall, I think, mm-hmm. right? He he Keiko beat him by four kilos. Had Gavin gotten that squat or even the lower number that we were talking about, he would have then positioned himself to, to, to beat Jonathan. So it's one of those things where it's like, man, if Gavin can put together this nine for nine day and he's he he just he's got to get a third squat in, yeah, and then matter of factly make his other lifts. You know, he's not gonna catch Keiko in the bench you know, because Keiko's an other, you know, worldly bench presser and has the world record, but his deadlift is coming around and he's getting closer in the deadlift too. And so all that is to say that I think it's super exciting because again, as we said at the, at the lead into this, the, the, the talent pool is, is rising. The high tide is rising. The tide is rising and the talent pool is getting deeper and deeper. 
Yeah. And so look, when these guys run it back at worlds, you're going to see these guys come out and then you're going to throw Gustav Hedlund into the mix and, and hopefully Emil Krostev, you know, now it's, it's Healthy. well documented. He was injured coming into the competition. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Emil still lifted well, even, even though it was well beneath his capabilities, I think Emil still went, what, well, he went seven for nine, if I'm not, yeah, Emil went seven for nine um, and still had a pretty good day, all things considered. So when mm-hmm. you throw him back into the mix and you throw uh, Gustav into the mix, and then, of course, you've got Gavin and Jonathan, and then um, you've got uh, Sasha from Germany, I believe it is. You've got, you got five killers there, man, and it's yeah. going to come, come down to attempt selection and execution, so... And then just thinking like Chance Mitchell's out there somewhere waiting in the wings as well. I mean, this yeah, class exactly. is so ridiculously yeah. stacked. Yeah, it's just a stacked, exactly. It's a stacked weight class. So again, I mean, that's how the day unfolded. It was cool to see both of those guys, two Americans, uh, go eight for nine. And you had you had an all-American podium there, if you will, with Jesus and Jonathan yeah. and Gavin. And that's really exciting to see. It's, it's, it's good for powerlifting america it's good for us obviously you know kind of that nationalistic pride if you will yeah of course you know I mean? team I mean, usa baby you, you, you cheer for your homies right you cheer yeah. for the home team i mean so it's it, it's exciting to see so yeah that was an exciting scenario to see um in the 93s that was a lot of fun to watch so real quick on on before we move on um you know gavin weighed in 92.9 and yep. Kaiko had 92.5 so Kaiko has a body weight advantage Kaiko totals 884 so that means that gavin has to total 885 essentially unless he can get a chip and can total 884.5 correct um, he can't total 884 and tie and and when he if he ties he loses um and it, like we're, we're saying here, he lost by four. So let's just say on that third squat, he yep. just takes five kilo jump, which is not even a world record. Yep. Um, and just goes from 325 up to 330. He wins. He finishes in second place behind Jesus. And right. I mean, now Gavin, you know, I love Gavin. I mean, I think Gavin's like one of the greatest, you know, and he's so young and his attitude. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about him. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's a stud. We, we all love him. Yeah. Um, and you and I know from the first time that we sat down and had dinner with him in Austin last year, um, he has a certain kind of attitude about game day coaching and things right. like this. And he had said on the podcast and Ryan repeated it, you know, after the fact on, on the podcast as well, that he wasn't there to just pick up, you know, individual lift records and things like this. But if that were the case, if he had only taken five and not gone for a, a big swing at the world record on squat, he, he wins, he beats Keiko. He walks away the greatest 93 in the world. And he walks away, you know, um, a lot of money, a lot of money richer than he ended up finishing in third. I mean, still a great finish. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, if he had even just chipped the existing world record, you know, 331.5, I mean, I think we, we both probably think he can get that and, and hit yeah. it to depth. And so it's interesting to think like, I, I mean, that seems like he, this was in his hands and they made a decision that ultimately in the end, come back to bit him. Now, again, you look at his second and you're thinking he's got a lot. I mean, I, I think 336, we saw it move. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. it's there. So, yep. so you can't really fault him. Like we say, we're doing the Monday morning quarterback in here, but. Yeah. Um, and, and, and also just to stack one in, in Gavin's favor in the, in the win yep. column for him, if you will, this was the meat to do that. Like if there was one, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, you know, I, I mentioned this in the book on probably five occasions, you know, whatever. There's only one day out of the year when you can be a world champion. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's a title, a national championship or a world championship is a title that nobody can ever take away from you, regardless of what your total is. Clearly, lifters want to go out and, 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 and hit PBs whenever they can. And Gavin said before the fact, and I know that he'll, he'll go out on his shield and he'll hold true to this that he truly wants to test his limits. He wants to see what he's truly capable of. So if there was a time for him to do that, this was the time. Yeah. And so yeah. really in theory, all he truly lost out on was the, the, the money for the world record and then the money for to potentially come in second place. And yeah. so it's not like he'd lost a, a potential at a gold medal. So exactly. maybe, you know, he rethinks that strategy and plays his cards a little bit differently at Worlds. Um, I think Gavin is such a supreme talent. I was talking about this with somebody else, where it's one of those things where I think I think we can all see, and he's so he's so young. He's got room to grow still. His rate of adaptation is high. 
and it might be higher than some of these other 93 lifters, mm -hmm. right? And so eventually, matter of factly, his talent may just supersede what Overall. others can do. Having said that, you still, I think, want to cherish these opportunities at world championships to play the game a little bit, man. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's at Worlds. Again, at this meet, go ahead, be a little bit more cavalier in your approach. Swing for the fences a little bit more because the only thing you lost potentially was some money. But at a world championships, when you can only be a world champion one day out of the year, that's the time where I think, man, you, 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 you play the game a little bit, be a little bit more conservative. And, you know, he just has to come back and sink that third squat. That's all. You know, if, yeah, if he does that, I think the outcome will take care of itself. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Again, yeah, he goes nine for nine. If he goes nine yeah. for nine, he, he beats Keiko, wins, okay. takes second, gets the gold, gets the silver, uh, or, you know, for this event and, you know, right. raises up, gets, moves up a, a spot, comes home with more cash, whatnot. Um, a question also on the, on these 93s with Keiko, um, you know, his second squat looked kind of slow, looked like a lot of work, 300. Then he comes out and he only goes up two and a half kilos. What's your take on that? Whether he should have just passed that, I mean, hindsight, again, Monday morning quarterback, he ended up missing it. So, you know, he didn't get those extra two and a half kilos. It only hurt him two and a half kilos, but it looked like it was taxing. I mean, it looked like work and it looked like uh, that third attempt, you know, might have taken something out of him that he might have been able a little bit, you know, had a little bit more on deadlift in the end, or maybe had a little bit more on bench if he hadn't have uh, missed, taken such two grinders, essentially. Yeah. So his, you know, uh, his PB squat is 305. So okay. when we kind of look at the numbers, that 300 uh, second attempt is a very, very robust second attempt. I mean, mm -hmm. if we, if we run the math on that, that's about a 98.4% second attempt. That's really, really close to your ceiling. So that if you do get it, it almost essentially mandates, right? a smaller third. In his case, it was so much of a grinder that like you said, they only went up to two and a half. He fought like hell to lift it. And then he got some up and down in the bar. Mm -hmm. and it's like, how much did you empty that gas tank for only two and a half kilos, which, you know, and look, I wasn't behind the scenes. I wasn't privy to those conversations. You and I can Monday morning quarterback this. 100%. I have no idea what he was talking about with his coaches. Maybe he thought, hey, look, I got a little bit of out of position on the 300 on the second attempt. Maybe they were projecting, you know, maybe his training was saying, I've got 310, 312 in me. And so in that case, 300 was a pragmatic and appropriate second attempt. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the information that we're not privy to. It's easy for us to just say, oh, yeah, well, you shouldn't have taken 300, you know, whatever. But totally. You know, and maybe he got out of position on that 300. But yeah, that's one of those instances where you grind so hard on the second attempt that you would consider passing. You know, I talk about that in the book. You don't want to forfeit 11% of your scoring opportunities, which is essentially one attempt. But that would be one case where maybe you have that conversation. You know, maybe you put the number on the bar but then you just decide better of it and not come out for it, you know, because yeah. it's like, how much did it wind up taking out of you, you know, and, and, and look, credit to Jonathan, that was the only attempt he missed. And, and so, and he still and, walked away with the greatest 93 performance <laughs> ever, you know, so. Exactly. So the jokes <laughs> on the, the jokes on us, so to speak, and, yeah. and, in, in that regard, but, um, but who knows, you know, maybe if he hadn't worked so hard, he might've deadlifted a little bit more, but he didn't need to at that point anyway. So whatever. Well, all of this, you know, discussion that we're doing is all in the spirit of making, you know, wanting, wanting these lifters to, to be better and do better. And then educating, you know, anyone who may be listening to yep. this and in a similar position. So, you know, we're just trying, you know, we're not, we're nothing against, obviously both of these guys know that we love them to death. Yeah. So I don't well, think not, and that, that, not to, that not to mention that the two of these guys are tip of the spear type athletes. Yeah, exactly. Tip of the spear type lifters. And so, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's all, it's all Monday morning quarterbacking, which, which makes for good conversation. But like you said, it's conversations like these that help to educate people in terms yeah. of how we make some of these decisions behind the scenes. Um, and, and I know you, you might know the number off the top of your head, but when you miss your third squat there, the probability of missing your third deadlift goes up. Is that I mean, yeah, exactly. So what we see is, is we see that when lifters miss their third squat, so 25% of all lifters 
who missed or uh, will miss both their third squat and their third deadlift. Okay. So like I said, so if you can, if you can, if you can make your third squat and, and we know that about 43 and a half percent of people miss their third squat. So almost half, right? Basically half of third attempts in squat bench deadlift are missed roughly okay. half, roughly. And so if you make your thirds, you're essentially automatically doing better than half of the field. Even yeah. if you take a number that is slightly lower than your capabilities, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so, and, and that's why these are high level decisions that need to be made and game planning and strategy and all these things need to be discussed beforehand. Because when you factor in travel and you factor in money and you factor in records and, and you factor in titles, and then of course, you know, the last thing would be your legacy, competitive legacy. When you factor in all these things, man, it's a lot of stuff to consider. And so that's why you need an, an objective voice of reason in the heat of battle. Cause yeah. you know, you're, you're all caught up in your feels and your feelings when you come off the platform and yeah. you need somebody there to be objective and to be mindful of what's at stake. Well, I mean, hats off to both of their, their game day coaches, because I mean, they miss, especially Keiko, like that looked like it took something out of him. And then for them to then go six for six from that point yeah. on, both of them, that's yep. huge for not only for, you know, that, that says a lot about them as athletes overcoming adversity and also their coaches putting in the right numbers on those third deadlift attempts and their third bench attempts so that they make all of those, you know, adjusting, yep. you know, maybe adjusting the, the lifts down a little bit, taking into account, Hey, that third squat was a real grind for, for, for Kaiko. And it's a miss, you know, still for, for Gavin, even though it didn't look like you know, crazy hard or anything, but right. yeah. All right. Um, it, the other question that I had was I'm um, talking about Amanda Lawrence. Okay. So like, I think like if there's an unheralded person in this, in this event, like, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge Amanda fan. I've been singing her praises. Uh, she told me on the, on the check-in with her going into this, that she was going to put up legendary numbers and she was fired up. And I mean, I think, I think we saw a spark of you know, of what Amanda is capable of at this, at this event. Like she was super pumped for it. She was healthy. She was back on form. And so I wanted to just think about, um, again, with her attempt selection. So she broke the world record squat on her second and third. She went nine for nine. She had an amazing day. She put up the biggest deadlift in all time, you know, of any woman ever, you know, taking that, that title away from Jessica Bittner. And, you know, she broke the deadlift world record on her second and then broke it again on her third. I mean, um, so uh, with this situation, we talked about a little bit before, maybe should Gavin have tried to just chip the world record on his second, you know, what do you try to do? Um, what do you think that Amanda is capable of if she doesn't go for world records on the squat? I mean, if this isn't Sheffield, if we're looking at, uh, if this was IPF worlds and, you know, how would you have played this, these cards a little bit differently? Yeah. So, so typically I don't recommend and I mentioned this in the book. Yeah, it's in the book. That's oh, why I brought I it up. Yeah, yeah. I do, and it's a great point. to. I, I typically don't recommend going for a PB or a record, uh, be it national or world, on the second attempt, unless one of two things has happened. Or one of three things. Um, unless your strength, your rate of adaptation has proven. There's training evidence. There's reliable data that your strength has then ascended to a level that is commensurate with you taking a record or a PB mm -hmm. on your second attempt. So if you've, you know, and you'll see that with novices because novices, juniors, yeah. juniors all the time, they're getting so strong so fast that, you know, their third attempt might be their opener at their next meet. I mean, it's, some of them are getting literally that strong. So if your strength is ascending that quickly, then, then yes, you could perhaps go for a personal best on your second attempt or a record on your second attempt. But you have to remember records, be it national and especially world records are outlier performances. Yeah. Right. They're outlier performances. And so when you essentially swing for the fences and, and go so hard on your second attempt, you're chasing this outlier performance in, a, in Amanda's case, she was chasing her own performances, right? Yeah. Her own, her, the records are hers to begin with. Right. And so but you're swinging so hard on your second attempt that if when you take that high percentage of a max where you're essentially going over what your previous best was, you're matter of factly revving the engine or emptying the tank, if you will, so much on your second attempt, there's number one, there's less 
room or there's less margin for error. You've got to be spot on. If something is not just perfect, you know what I mean? Um, there, there's a higher probability for error. Okay? Yeah. And, 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 and less room, le, le, less margin for error, I should say. Um, and, and, and then if you do get it, if you are fortunate to get it, in all likelihood, it means that you're going to have to take a much smaller progression to your third attempt because you're you're using up so much gas in the tank that you're not going to have much energy left. Now, hey, look, to Amanda's credit, she was able to do that. But you saw yeah. in the squat, she jumped 14 kilos from her first to her second, which at that strength level, that's that's fine. She's squatting in the in the low to mid fives. Yeah. That's okay. She's strong enough to do that. But then she only went up two and a half kilos to the third one. So it's like, in theory, if she'd taken a smaller opener and a more mid-range second, I don't know. I mean, again, it's all speculative at this point. Totally, totally. But we've seen her training. And I know that sometimes she puts out videos and she might be at a slightly heavier body weight when she posts those. So we got to factor that in as well. But maybe she squats the 250 that she's hitting in training. Or yes. something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and and the same can be said for the deadlift too. She took a really big jump in the deadlift. She took an 18 and a half kilo jump in the deadlift and then only went up seven and a half kilos. And mm -hmm. once again, at that strength level, she's probably strong enough to do like a like a, a 12 and a 12 or a 12 and a 10 or maybe even a 15 and a 10 kilo jump or those sorts of things. And so look, it all worked out for her. Who am I to criticize? You know what I mean? And we're not, you know, we're, you know. Yep, exactly. It's just, you know, and and again, it's just speculative. I'm just speculating that if her attempts had been slightly different, that maybe she could have lifted more on her thirds. It's no guarantee, uh, but she did. She had a legendary performance. Credit goes to her. World record squat, world record deadlift, and a world record in total. You know, in her bench for crying out loud, well, I think was only two and a half kilos. Yeah, two and a half kilos off of her all-time PB in the bench. So, I mean, it's like, man, like what more can you ask for? Girl goes nine for nine. Yeah. She hits three out of four possible PBs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know she didn't quote unquote podium. She came in fourth place. But I mean, she's stacked up against a murderer's row, you know what I mean, of other, of, of other lifters. And maybe their, their world records were just slightly more attainable than Amanda's was. Yeah. You know I, mean? I mean, a little bit of victim of your own success because yeah. she's broken those world records so many times, you know, in the past, if she had left those world records dangling a lot lower, um, then this 645 performance would have been a bigger percent of the world record. And I think that's one of those things where, you know, there's going to be some outliers and there's going to be some little anomalies here where like maybe the 52 world records a little low, maybe the 84 uh, world record is a little high because Amanda and Danny, you know, pushed each other before. And then Amanda has pushed and pushed and she's, she's that kind of fiery competitor where she, you know, likes to go out and break her world records and stuff like that. Um, also there's something to consider about like getting two cracks at the money on these lifts, you know, like you, you for sure want to be able to secure, uh, a shot at, you know, the, the world record on the individual lifts and collect those $5,000 or 5,000 pound, checks um yep. but i that was kind of the the thinking behind my question was sort of like the total ended up being six was it 645 645 amazing yeah. ridiculous total um Crazy. could it have been 650 if she didn't you know break the squat world record twice and deadlift world record twice you know what i'm yeah. saying so that was kind of the question in which case maybe she would have had a better shot at these this percentage of the world record base scoring formula that she ended up you know coming in fourth on yeah, uh -huh. like you said, I mean, kind of a victim of her own success potentially. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and look, again, not, the, the, they had their strategy worked out. She executed her strategy. She went nine for nine. And I think, you know, the only thing is that, you know, knowing Amanda, knowing the fiery competitor that she is, she probably, you know, she would have liked to have placed a little bit higher. You know what I mean? And I think she's used to, uh, you know, coming out on the top end of these things, you know, in these metrics based competitions, if you will. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, fourth fourth place is 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 not a place that Amanda is, no. is is used to being in, and I mean that as a compliment in every sense of the word. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And so it's yeah, I mean it's just uh, you know it's also worth worth mentioning, and this is to take nothing away from Jesus Olivares and his performance, but just to put it in perspective, like you said, victim of your own success, and when you hit totals, it's it's well documented that Taylor was injured 
had had three different things that he was dealing with. And then, oh, by the way, he gets food poisoning, you know, yeah. the, day, the two days before he, he was he was a mess there for a minute. He only would have needed to total 825 kilos, by the way, to mm-hmm. overtake to overtake Jesus's. I ran the numbers. So, you know, everybody knows that Taylor's uh, signature performance was 838.5. His world record is 790.5. And so I did the math. He would have only needed an 825. And I say only. Only. Because I mean, that is. Sakes, you know what I mean? Only an 825 total. Had he matched his total. If he'd have hit 838.5 again, he would have been 6% over the world record, which would have been even better than Evie Corrigan's than Evie did. So yeah. it's just like one of those things where it's like, you know, mm. and I mean, obviously we can't say enough good things about Taylor. I mean, of course, and it, you know, but anyway, it just kind of puts all that stuff in perspective in terms yeah. of, um, you know, this is an interesting metrics to use in terms of determining the, the, the winner. And, and again, going back to what we said before, I think it's the fairest one. So, And I, I also think that it's something where if there's anomalies in there, like you say, like Taylor's is, a, is kind of a low because he's right. never really been pushed to, to break it too hard at a world championship. Um, right. This kind of stuff's going to get ironed out as we go forward. I mean, now the 52 kilo world record is not low. It's very high. So, I mean, and so it'll be more of a test of who's progressing year on year, as opposed to, you know, this first one, there are a little bit of outlier performances. And I do want to, I have to mention for Amanda's sake, I mean, if we do look at some of the other metrics, she she blew, she blows everyone away. I mean, we look at good lift points, we look at dots. Uh, right. She's number one on both by a ways. I mean, uh, her good lift points was good enough to win best lifter at IPF worlds in South Africa this year by a ways by like two, 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 three, four points, um, which yeah. is a lot. Um, and then, and then if we look at it based on dots, which I think, you know, most people think is in terms of formula is probably one of the better ones. Um, you know, 595 dots. That's the second greatest dots of all time by a woman only behind Leah Bavois, who we could also mention, you know, injured, didn't have the performance that she wanted. She also had a world record that she could have gone after and put, you know, 5% on and possibly, you know, like Taylor, you know, um, you walked away with the the gold medal in this event. So. Yeah, exactly. Something to think about. Um, so, okay. Was there any other ones? I mean, we talked, we talked to Zeus, like, like you, you know, you coach, Dr. Ray Williams. Um, so, you know, this has always been the thing. Jesus and Ray, Jesus and Ray. Um, Jesus has put up a total now that is pretty ridiculous. I mean, it's massive. Did you see, I mean, some of these lifts looked like there was more there. I mean, did it do, what did you think on like on his squat and his deadlift? You think there's more? So I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think he has, I thought the third squat was a, was a number that was called well, um, Mm -hmm. That, that if you look at that third squat, he kind of had that hitch in the middle, you know what yeah. I mean? That little, yep. that spot where he, he lost positioning, wobble. but yeah. he wobbled a little bit and then he was able to get through it. And he's got kind of that smile at the top, you know what I mean? Yeah. That he, that he hit. So I, I think clearly that was a good call. I mean, mm-hmm. who knows what he could have squatted uh, had he not kind of lost that position, but mm-hmm. again, hindsight, 2020, I think that was uh, I think that was a good uh, an appropriately called number based on how the 455 second attempt looked, you know what I mean? And credit to him. I mean, one of the things that I was concerned with going into the competition was clearly everybody on the planet that follows the sport knows that he has the strength to hit these lifts. Nobody was even remotely questioning his aptitude uh, to hit these lifts. What I think was in question, and he silenced it, he put it to rest, he silenced the critics, he, he convinced the doubters, if there were any, was could he squat over a thousand pounds in competition? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If we remember at PA Nationals a year ago, he squatted 450 kilos, which is 992. You know what I mean? Clearly that day, he looked like he was good for more than a thousand. But you have this landmark number, if you will, or this, you know, this thousand pound barrier if, the, if, if there is such a thing as a barrier but this mm-hmm. it's just this huge milestone this hurdle that he'd yet to cross in competition well now he's done it twice because he squatted over a grand on his on a second attempt and his third attempt yeah. so he put he put that to bed and put that to rest and and could he do it at an international meet under strict judging and with the travel and the time zone change and he did that too so mm-hmm. he he literally and figuratively checked all the boxes so 
getting back to your question, I think the squat was called beautifully. I think the bench was pretty much dead on. Mm -hmm. um, 600 was tough, but he got it. Um, yeah. The deadlift, I think, looked the easiest out of all of the third attempts, right? Mm -hmm. Having said that, it was turned down in the moment. And so if you recall, that was when the, 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 the scoring lights had kind of hit a glitch. And yeah. so they just used their thumbs. And so the, we don't know what lights were given. Mm -hmm. Presumably it was knees and lockout because that seems to be what his issue is, is soft knees and the hips aren't all the way through. Um, so it was originally turned, turned down as we know, but again, as I said, we don't know the reasons. I'm just speculating that that's what I thought could have been the reasons. And then of course the lift was overturned, um, in his favor. Um, so it's hard to say how much more he would be good for. He stood up with that 410 fast. I mean, that was quick. Yeah. It's, it's, we've never seen Jesus grind a deadlift mm -hmm. because yeah. that's not his weakness his weakness is his grip and is locking his knees getting his knees and hips locked according to standard so it's really going to become a function of what he can hang on to and what he can satisfy the standard with i yeah. mean i think looking at that attempt it's like my god maybe he had another 15 kilos that he's capable of physically standing up with it's just could his yeah. hands hang on to it and then could he get his knees locked and his and his and his hips locked so um if you go back and look live at look at the live stream, he did get away with one on his first attempt because he dropped the bar. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we got a ton of was, comments on that on Instagram, by the way. <laughs> it was very, it was very obvious to me in the front row, but the judges clearly missed it. And I'm not hating on Jesus. This is not, no, not at all. Because let me tell you something. Had I been his coach, his game day coach, and had he gotten called on that opener for dropping the bar, which he cl he clearly did. And if you go back and watch the live stream, you can see it. You can watch it in slow motion. He let go of the bar. Yeah, uh, yeah. Clearly. I still would have gone up to the second attempt because he stood up with that opener so fast. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would have had no doubt in my mind that he could have stood up with the second attempt, broken the world record as he did, raised deadlift record. And then he would have intentionally set the bar down carefully. Yeah. So... I'm not second guessing. I'm just saying that he got away with one. That's all I'm saying. Totally, so totally. I, I mean, thought in terms of in terms of performance standards, I thought his second deadlift was the best. I I could see why they called him on his third one. But again, to be fair, with some of these supers, man, it's hard to tell with the yeah. knee bend and knees locked and hips and so whatever. So yeah, I mean, it's again, I'm not hating or throwing shade. It's, you know, he went nine for nine. He knocked it out of the park. They overturned it in his favor. So clearly the jury thought it was good and that's all that matters. And so it's, yeah, congrats to him. Just an otherworldly performance, but it's really hard to say how much he might've had left in the deadlift because of those reasons. Okay. Yeah. So as far as actual attempt selections are concerned, pretty much dead on nice, nice attempt selections. Yeah. Good attempt selection. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. who am I to say that they did it wrong? I mean, he, made, he he went nine for nine and he, ma he made all the attempts. I thought everything was pretty much dead on. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, credit to him. Man, he's 24 years old. I mean, this, these numbers, I mean, like, what, what are we looking at here as far as like what, what the, the ceiling could be? I mean, we're talking about breaking bar mental barriers on what we thought was possible. I think he's already basically done it. And yeah, and he's also kind of ignited our imagination on what might be possible going forward. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. So you, you, you know, now the thing is now that he's done this and all credit due to him, you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. want to see some consistency. And so you want to, you want to, I mean, and look, we all yearn for that for, for, for more, for everybody. We want to see him be able to repeat this and to be able to, to push the boundaries even further. And so, you know, obviously the objective in Malta, the number one objective should be to win clearly, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, looking at the nominations that have been put in already, you know, unless Jesus were to have a catastrophic performance, um, which we don't suspect he would have, um, he's going to win. And so, because he's matter of factly the apex predator, the strongest guy in the room. And so yeah. we want to see him push the boundaries of human performance and how much can he possibly lift? And so, yeah, I mean, 
Clearly, we all think he can do more. He's so young, his rate of, uh, of adaptation is high. So again, long trip to Malta, you know, long flight, but we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that he can't do it. I mean, I, I think as a fan of the sport, as someone who likes seeing these big numbers and wants these lifters to succeed, we want to see these performances. You want to see him lift more, you mm -hmm. know? And, yeah, and, and I think, and, and, and hopefully he can. And I think uh, kind of to your point, um, you know, there's, there's not, it doesn't look like there's going to be a huge challenge at uh, IPF world. So, and they've already mentioned that he's qualified for Sheffield next year. So yep. I think we're going to be waiting until Sheffield next year before we <laughs> yeah. see this performance. And rightfully so, I think he should, he should uh, do that on the biggest stage and, um, you know, secure the bag, so to speak um, in Malta, get the dub, get the gold medal, <clears throat> yeah. get those, get those points for team USA. And then, uh, go back to Sheffield and, and see what he can do again with this big ass number. But yeah. yeah, man, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, he's got an opportunity. Like you said, there's only one day a year you can be world champion. He's got an opportunity to three Pete, um, yeah. three in a row. And so, yeah. I mean, I think he, that that's the goal. And then let's see where he can push this back again in Sheffield. Um, was there any other numbers that you want to talk about? I mean, you know, Bonica, uh, she kicked ass. I mean, she went nine for nine. She, she, her, she's again, a victim of her own success where she's been pushing those world records. She loves breaking her squat world record all, all the time. And so, you know, there's, there's stuff there, there's there. Um, and then there's some other examples of people, you know, kind of going for, a t uh, world records on their second and having it not work out. Um, whereas we saw that it kind of did work out when it came to Amanda and when it came to Bonica, but um, not as much with others. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on, on Bonica's performance? Yeah, I thought, I mean, look, Bo Bo Bonica had an outstanding performance. Um, you know, she went nine for nine. She secured that squat world record. Um, she secured uh, the total world record, obviously. Um, and she hit a deadlift PB. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, look, this is a, a, a weight class based sport and uh, she competes as a super. She came in, almost as heavy as she's ever been. So, which, okay. which, which I think is worth discussing, you know, sometimes there's this unwritten rule that we're not supposed to talk about that with women, but it's, I mean, mm -hmm. look, it's a weight class based sport. I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, but she was about five kilos heavier than she had been, I believe at her last competition. And so it, I was expecting that squat to, to go up. When I looked up at the board and saw that, you know, she was a little bit heavier. I was like, yep. I think she's gonna, she's gonna smash this world, and she did. She destroyed it, and so yeah. she's got more in the tank there in the squat. Um, I don't know what happened in the bench. She made all three benches, but I was a little surprised because obviously, when you gain weight, leverages improve for squatting and bench pressing. I was expecting the bench to be a little bit higher. That's not to say that she had a bad bench. She didn't. She went three for three. And I think she benched 147 and a half. I think her best is 155. So I was, you know, I don't know if her training didn't go as well as she'd wanted or if she was dealing with some kind of injury or overuse injury or what have you. I just thought that the bench would have been a little bit higher based on that fact. Uh, mm -hmm. The deadlift, she hit a deadlift PB by two and a half kilos. And um, yeah, the, the, her deadlifts kind of like Jesus's but in a different way because she pulled sumo. It's just the nature of the way that these supers are built, right? Sometimes the deadlifts are gonna look a little bit untidy. It's yeah. not gonna be the most, you know, and look, we talk about this as well. Max lifts are not always gonna look like ballet. I don't yeah. care what weight class you're in, mm -hmm. but, for, but for supers, when you've got a lot of muscle mass and a lot of body mass, if you will, sometimes the deadlift is gonna look a little glitchy or a little mm -hmm. untidy. And she got called to, she, she got the lift in her favor two to one. And frankly, it was like, man, she blew that up. Like she stood up with that 252 and a half pretty fast. She got a red light for, for lockout. So I think they caught her for one of her knees or her hips or something. But so it's like, man, I think she had more of the tank. Like, you know, and, and I'm saying that in a complimentary way, the mm -hmm. strength is there. It's just a matter of making it look good enough to satisfy the performance standards. And she did two to one. Um, but it's, you know, what's on the horizon for her in terms of potentially pulling more. I mean, cause she made that 252 look easy. I mean, yeah. it, 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 uh, it, to me, it looked like she had probably 257 to 260 even, you know what I mean? Strength wise. Now should, could she have met the standard with two six? I don't know that maybe not, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Cause she was got the one red light, but she had a fantastic performance again, 
to your point, somebody who's been the victim of her own success. I mean, she's won at all levels in both equipped <laughs> and raw. I mean, she's essentially been undefeated. She's won world games and so forth. And so, mm. yeah, I think lifters like her and Amanda and their fiery competitors, both of them, seek want competition. Well, good news for Bonica in that regard. She's going to have it this year because mm -hmm. she's going to have Sonita coming up. You know what I mean? Yeah. That nominated total that she has for Sonita is not what I believe I'm saying her name correctly. Right? Yeah, Sonita. Um, yeah, from Belgium. And yeah. so, yeah, she, I mean, she just put up a, a huge gym total and, and albeit that's a gym total. That's, I don't believe she did those lifts all in the same day and that's in the gym. And we all know that that doesn't mean anything. Um, mm -hmm. So she's got to, she's got to come out and put that on the platform and show and prove. But all that is to say is that, um, I think we're in for a bit more of a battle than we're used to seeing in the 84 plus category. And I think that's exciting because um, you want to see competition. You want yeah. to see head to head battles. You want to see the cream rise to the top. And so uh, hopefully these two ladies can, can, can push each other and, 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 and may the strongest one and the best one win. Yeah, and I mean we're looking we're looking uh, at the these nominated totals here. Sonita's got uh, six sixty one. Bonica did eight six eighty at Sheffield, um, and and I think we both kind of thought that Bonica had more in the tank. Oh, she, totally. it looks like she's certainly trending in the right direction. Maybe yeah. maybe there's I, I even thought her second bench moved really fast. I was surprised when she only went up two and a half, and yeah. then the two and a half, there was like a little bit of a stall at a spot. And you're like, okay, maybe, maybe probably still had another two and a half if she wanted to fight through it, but we don't know like what was going on with her training. Obviously shell yeah. is, is super in tune with what she's got going on. And it, so it ended up looking like, yep. you know, like if I were judging off her second, I'm might've overextended her on her third bench, just based on how that third one did end up moving. Right. Um, but it certainly seemed like she's going to have get closer to her PB on bench at some point, yeah. you know, here going into think. Malta. Yep. And then and, and room and definitely room left in the squat. Holy crap, man. So, um, I mean, yeah, we might be looking at, there's a possibility of a 700 kilo total yeah. here on the horizon. I mean, yeah. and it might not be very far off on the horizon and especially exactly. with Sonita kind of chopping at her heels here a little bit. I, I'm excited to, to see Bonica fired up like this and have a challenger. And I mean, cause she, she definitely was fired up coming into the chef. I oh, mean, yeah, she for sure. definitely, it definitely pushed her just being in this competition. Um, now she's going to have a weight class battle on her hands as well. Um, I'm, I'm pumped to see, you know, she obviously was fired up after some calls that went down in South Africa and in Birmingham at world games and stuff. So I think we're going to see the best. I mean, we, we obviously already saw the, you know, 680. that's the best we've seen. Um, but we're, I think we're the best is yet to come when it comes to Bonica. I agree. And credit to her. She executes at a high level. She executes her lift to an exemplary standard. Um, the lone exception being in the deadlift, right? I mean, she, she buries her squats. Her benches are beyond reproach. I mean, all of her benches yes. always look pristine. You know what I mean? It's like, look, when she misses a lift in the other two disciplines, it's, you know, the, the squat and the bench is on strength. You know what I mean? Or it's, mm -hmm. or it's because, yeah. Um, but in, in the deadlift is the only place where she might lose something or miss a lift on a technicality. So that, that that's credit to her for going out and, 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 and getting white lights. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and she generally gets at least two white lights on her deadlift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. She does. Yeah. I mean, and look, that's why you have three referees, right? I mean, that's, yeah. you, have, you have three and, and yeah. So, I mean, she, all you need is two. <laughs> You don't need all three, thank God. Yeah. Um, all right. So I know we're going super long here, man. I don't want to keep you up all night. Like for people oh, who are just listening, we're getting close to 11 o'clock. Um, the other thing I just, you know, there were some athletes that missed a lot of attempts and, you know, um, and they, they kind of did fall victim to some of the Matt Gary no-nos that you wouldn't want to do, like going for PBs or world records on their second attempts, things like this. Um, was there anyone, you know, that you see out there that like you, you, you think they might've just had a bad strategy on the day, but looking forward to Malta, the, like the sky's the limit, you know, like what they could potentially put up. Yeah. I think kind of, kind of perusing the outcomes here. I mean, so we saw, we saw, you know, Tiffany Chapon comes to mind. Um, yeah. now 
want to give her credit. First of all, for those of her, uh, for those listeners who don't know her background, apparently she's a boxer or used yeah. to be a boxer. She um, well, be careful what you say. I know, man. She, <laughs> you when you walk around her, she has this presence, and I, again, I mean this in a complimentary way. Mm-hmm. Like she's got a little bit of a chip on her shoulder. Yeah. Like like don't look at me cross-eyed because I'll knock your block off type of thing. And so she's a, she's a fiery competitor. She went for the world record squat on her second attempt, missed it on strength, and then came back and got it. And that's extremely rare. That, mm. re- that, that doesn't usually happen. Um, that's a unicorn. Yeah, that really is a unicorn, is missing a lift on strength particularly when it's a world record and then coming back and getting it on her third. So credit to her for getting it on her third. Um, she went for the world record on her second bench and missed it and then missed it again on her third, you know, so attempt selection strategy there probably would have opened a little bit lighter, you know, as it, you know, her, her opener is probably what I would have taken on her second attempt. So again, hindsight, I probably mm-hmm. would have had her open at 90 and then go to, you know, and then go to 95 on the second and then try the world record on the third. I think she kind of gassed herself with too heavy of an opener. Um, and then, um, you know, and then she just missed her final deadlift. But, you know, having said all that, I guess she came in, what, fourth, fifth, sixth. She came in seventh place, um, still was able to broke, break her world record, um, albeit by just a little bit. But, I mean, clearly she's the premier 47, you know, I mean, she's doing stuff at 47 kilos that we've never seen done before. Um, so crazy. Four, I, I mean, but, that's what, that's what I was kind of getting at with, with her is that yeah. all these misses and all this taxing yourself out, trying to break a world record squad on your second missing on strength, coming back and fighting that world record weight again, and then getting it and then fighting that world record weight two times on bench yeah. and then still breaking the world record and putting up a 428. No. Point five is just like damn, it's, like like it's where nuts. could she be with yeah. you know a smarter attempt game day strategy? God, I mean, I I I I'm scared to even think about what her total might possibly be able to. Yeah, I know, mean, closer to closer to four forty, right? I mean, if we just I mean, yeah, you just like which is just silly. I mean, it's just I mean, you know, that was not too long ago a silly total of fifty two. Exactly, then, that's yeah, what I'm and, saying. And it's so just, now we're seeing forty seven kilo lifters do that. So. I mean, that was a case, um, again, obviously looking, you know, a little bit further at the results. Um, just want to give a shout out to, uh, to Carlina Tongatia. I mean, she's still, I mean, she missed all of her thirds. I thought she got a raw deal on that third squat. I, I've watched, mm-hmm. I, I sent her the video and I told her this, um, and, and I, I thought she got robbed. I didn't see any up and down movement on the bar on her third squat. I know that she got called for depth and up and down on my hip, which would have been her left hip. I thought it was good. I thought it was in, maybe she got called on her right hip. I didn't see any up and down. I mean, it was a limit lift. She had to fight like hell to get it. She was wobbling, but I never saw the bar go down. But again, I'm sitting in the front row and I can't see those things. And then Mm -hmm. she misses her third or or she basically missed all of her thirds. Um, I know she was disappointed from that standpoint that this is like the first meet in a while. But again, she set the bar so high for herself, hitting that total at Commonwealth 600, which is just insane, right? But I think, look, I think we see her come to Malta and I think we're going to see her make those lifts and potentially put up something. I mean, if she'd have made those thirds, I think I did the math. I think she would have been at like a 613 and a half or something like that. I mean, something stupid, right? So I think if she if she's able to secure those third lifts, we're looking at a total from Carlina in that 610 to 620 range. You know what I mean? Which um, is would, like a full, like 25 kilos more than what we saw in South Africa, which we thought was like, I mean, and is a spectacular performance by Agatha and Jess. Exactly. So, yeah. So, I mean, that'll be something to be on the lookout for in Malta. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Chandler Babb obviously didn't have the day that she wanted, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Kind of, has employed a strategy of, of, of what I think is opening up a little bit too heavy. I don't know what the rationale was behind some of her selections, um, but clearly they kind of, you know, and, and a lifter in her case where she truly, you know, or so we thought on paper really probably only had a shot at breaking that 60, uh, 
three kilo deadlift world record, trying to take away Kimberly Walford's deadlift record that's mm -hmm. been there for a while. Um, but, um, you know, Chandler missed her opening bench. It was really, and then decided to actually go up, which mm -hmm. like blew my mind. Like, and again, not privy to the conversation. Don't know what happened. Don't know if she totally. felt like, look, I got out of position, et cetera, et cetera. But it looked to be kind of a strength issue on the first one where it was untidy and they got her on a technicality and then she went up anyway. And thank God she was able to make it. Um, kind of opened up pretty damn heavy in the deadlift. I think that that, I mean, and she still almost got that world record on her third. Yeah, I think so, I mean, so she, she close. pretty much had it, I thought. Yeah, like kind of fell over at yeah. the top there. So I think, you know, maybe with some better attempt selections, not opening up so heavy, taking, you, you know, her, she opened it where I probably would have had her second attempt, you know, because mm -hmm. she's got a PB of 237 and a half and she opened at 230. So that's kind of like right where I probably would have had her second attempt be, you know, in, 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 a, in a perfect like SSPT, Matt Gary world or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But still, you know, she still almost had the third deadlift. So um, with some of these lifters, who, who really weren't in the running to break the world record total. I yeah. think probably they came in with the mindset of, look, I've got to be aggressive and try to get some cash. You know what I mean? On and the so, lift that I am the best at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so look, I would have approached it a little bit differently. It doesn't make me right. Um, you and I can sit here and look at the results and watch the live stream and go back and him and haw and, you know, yeah. Monday morning quarterback at all we want. Um, we're not privy to all the behind the scenes stuff. So it's all speculative. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that was just another performance that kind of, you know, came to my attention. Um, obviously Amar kind of didn't have the day that he wanted, um, mm -hmm. you know, things, you, you know, um, he had a weird scenario in the bench, um, where he, he was given the opportunity to retake his, his attempt, but, but, but then he decided not to, cause the second one was so damn hard anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunate for him that he wasn't able to get that squat world record. I know, you know, and and so to your point, we didn't see a lot of individual world uh, records broken. You know what I mean? In, On the men's side. Yeah, it was just I, th I think what the the only individual world record, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, was Kaiko's was 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 Jonathan's bench, right? Um, yeah, um, who, and then Jesus and, and dead. Jesus's deadlift. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was it. Two, yeah, that was it. And then and then it was just the top three totals, of course, that mm -hmm. went over the mark. But, um, but yeah, so those were kind of some of the performances that kind of stood out to mind. I think it's going to be really exciting to see. Um, obviously, we talked about the 93s, but for those that don't know, the 105s, this was the podium at Worlds last year. Yep, it was yep. Emil, Mikey Davis, and Mo. And so, and, and, and that's how it kind of unfolded here. But they're all so tight and, and, and Mo being aggressive and going for that world record deadlift. I mean, look, yeah. Mo could have actually out totaled Emil and Mikey, I think, uh, if he had taken a smaller third. But to his, you know, his rationale and his line of thinking, like, why not swing for the damn fences on the deadlift and probably, you know, look, go, this is go the place for the money. To do it, like you, you said. Th exactly. This is the meat to do that. And so I don't, what a great guy. I love that dude. Got to talk yeah, to him. He lost to Emil by 15. Yeah. And um, if we and look at Mikey his. Might, 12 and a half, I think. Yeah. And he, but he jumped 20 kilos. So yeah, yeah 21 yeah. kilos. So he only Cause, needed. Cause, right. And he, and, and he was the lightest of all the lifters. Yeah. So had he taken, you know, I don't know if he'd have been good for 385 because 391 didn't get very far. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows? I mean, maybe, knows, but, but anyway. Um, oh, was the yeah. crowd going crazy during that? Oh man. When he first yeah. walked out, I'm sure. For yeah, for sure. I mean, just, and, and that was another thing that may, that I, that may have gotten lost on the live stream. But obviously for the hometown favorites, Joy Namani and, and Abdul Mo, um, just, man, the crowd was going crazy when they walked yeah. out. And, and, and rightfully so, right? It's the hometown heroes, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the French had the a French. big contingent. They, they, so there were, there were flags that got hung from some of the balconies, which I thought was totally cool. That's so awesome. when the French ladies and the French lifters went out there, man, the play that like that whole section just erupted. And so that was totally cool as well, man. That's uh, awesome. It, like, it's like soccer or like it is. Football. It's great. You know, right? I, I love that. Yeah. I was hearing Ryan on the, on the commentary, like the French people in the crowd are like on their feet and 
all this kind of stuff, man. Oh yeah. God, that sounded so cool. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, okay. La- the last one I want to ask you about is Kyoto, just because we got a dog in this fight. Um, at 66, we got Brian Lee. Um, they both yeah. have totaled right around the same seven thirteen point five for Brian. I think seven twelve or something for Kyoto. They're both right there. Kyoto did that seven twelve. I think a week out. And then came in and I mean, obviously, I think, you know, logic intuitively, you think, okay, he's probably not going to have that great of a performance given that he just went all out the week before, but still, I mean, handled himself pretty well. But I mean, what do you foresee going into Malta? Like what this guy is capable of? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, he, he hit that total at the Japanese nationals, like literally, I think it was six or seven days before. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and obviously kind of emptied his tank. I think, I think he kind of wanted to, in a way, you know, I haven't seen the results from that Japanese national. Yeah. It's not up on uh open. Yeah. Eye, I haven't been able. Yeah. So I, so I don't know, like if he had to do that, I, I kind of doubt it. I, I, I doubt it. I think he, he wanted to kind of put the world on notice and say, look, I'm not getting any love here going into Sheffield. Mm-hmm. Like, look at me, like, look at what I'm capable of doing. Um, and so has this incredible performance and then kind of emptied the tank. And then like, man, you come back a week later and it's going to be really difficult to travel to now travel from Japan to England and then try to reproduce that identical performance. Having said that, looking at his total and then looking obviously what Brian Lee did, which shocked the world at, you know, down in Austin at PA nationals. I mean, on paper, I've got, and this is going to sound like I'm such a homer, but I mean, just looking at the numbers, <laughs> I got, I got a favor, Brian, because, you know, presumably he's going to pull last, right? He's, mm-hmm. he's got the bigger deadlift. I think Brian pulled what 318 kilos. Was it at national yeah, 318.5? Yep. Yeah. 318.5. And Kyoto has only pulled, I think 300.5. So like, you know, I mean, that's probably like second attempt range for, for, right. for Brian. So, you know, Brian, clearly has to make his lifts. He's got to go over there. He's got to travel now. You know what I mean? Which to my understanding, I don't believe Brian's been out of the country, you know, in terms of doing an international competition. So we'll see, you know, he's, he's got a good coach in his corner in Joe Stanek, obviously. So, you know, but he's got to go to Malta now and he's got to execute at a high level um, and, and, and make all of his lifts and, and, and look, you know, being the strongest deadlifter in that, in that group puts him in, in, in the pole position, if you will, to be able to have that final say. And so that's a huge ace card for him to have up his sleeve. And I expect if they both execute that, that Brian will come, you know, victorious just because he'll be pulling last. So. Yeah. And I mean, uh, we were both there. We spoke with, we spoke with Brian afterwards in the press conference and stuff. He, he, he did not, I mean, while it looked like, you know, he was having a great day in, in the moment, he did miss a squat and then retake it. I mean, miss it on a technicality though. And it moved quick that, so this number 713.5, that's with the retake and squat that moved well on both, uh, both times he took it. And then that's with forfeiting a bench, you know? So we got to think that, uh, that 713.5, that he's got to have at least five more probably would be my guess just based on the squat and two, two and a half on each. Um, so that would put him up you know, five, eight, uh, seven, 18.5. This is a crazy total. I mean, this, this guy is amazing. I mean, I, we got a, we got a real stud on our squad here uh, for team USA. So I'm excited, but I'm also excited. I mean, Kyoto looks like a, a, a great lifter. I mean, he's yeah. jacked. I mean, he seemed like he was having a fun time, even though he, he obviously had, you know, the, the, the that, that's unfortunate to have to have a nationals one week out and actually go and compete at your nationals. Um, I think we saw with the Americans, you know, um, none of them had to do that um, with the way that we set it up for for powerlifting American Nationals. None of them had to do that. They all ended up showing up at Sheffield, you know, in pretty much in peak form, and all pretty much blew away the qualifying totals necessary for for going make it on the U.S. national yeah. team. So, yeah. I mean, that was one thing that our lifters might have had a little advantage over some of. Like, I know Joy Namani lifted the week before. I know yep. uh, Kyoto lifted the week before. So that's something that that they can iron out with their nationals in the future to kind of figure that out. But yeah, as far as totals are concerned, man, Brian, I mean, th- I'm glad though. It adds a little, it does add a little hype. He did kind of steal the limelight going into the meet. A lot of people were talking about uh, Kyoto, you know? Yeah, and so, sure. I mean, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look in this in this social media age, right? Where it, where where social media 
it helps our sport in that regard that it aggregates more eyeballs. It, mm. it, 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 it puts him in the consciousness and the stream of consciousness of other people now paying attention to the 66s. So now you've got him, you've got Brian Lee, you've got Penna, you've got all these, you know, these other yeah. lifters now you, that, you, that you're paying attention to. And so it makes for a more lively battle. And that's, you know, that's fun to watch. I mean, you want to yeah. see lifters duking it out for the podium. And that was a, a very heralded weight class last year. I mean, um, it was a stacked weight class. There were like four deep with Joe Jordan. Eddie Bergwin ends up one winning. Both of them move up to 74. And you're thinking, oh, and they just, that, that weight class just reloaded. I mean, with, yeah. with even bigger shooters in a way, you know, these guys yeah. putting up over 700. So it's pretty cool. Um, okay, the last guy, I just want to give uh, get the Matt Gary recap on Delaney Wallace. You know, I mean, yeah. Team USA goes one through four. He's kind of he gets the short end of the stick and is off the podium, doesn't get to get one of those cool Sheffield trophies. <laughs> but still, I mean, he, he was a showman. He had a hell of a day. He put up a big total. That's a weight class that you know a lot about with the 83s. Um, with one of your lifters or a guy that you've coached and handled in the past with with Joe uh with uh Deuce Gruden, you know, in that weight class. So so what do you think of uh, overall of Delaney's performance? You know, goes eight for eight and then just misses his final deadlift, you know, yeah, really yeah. barely. Yeah, a really fantastic performance for Delaney, right? I mean it's and 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 for lack of a better word, he was kind of due, right? Just because he'd had he'd had a couple of meets um that were less than his best. You know, he did the eight twenty two and a half, I think it was in in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, or no, not 19 in, in 21. Um, and since then hadn't yeah. reproduced that same total. We all knew that it was there, that the capability was there and for whatever reason, wasn't able to reproduce it, but now he did. And so, you know, came within like two inches, like I said, of, of locking out that third deadlift, which would have broken Russell or uh, total world record, you know? So, so Delaney, you know, and his team, put together a game plan that was strategic in that none of the individual left world records were on the table for him. So mm. clearly this was a guy who had to matter of factly build a total. And so he did that. And now he's got the second best total ever in history at 83 kilos. So it's like, it's indisputable. I mean, it's like, just like, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he ascended even more. I mean, he was already one of the, you know, one of the best 83s, but now he's even cemented that even more. And it's, and it's fantastic to see. So it's, you know, um, yeah, I mean, second best 83 kilo total. I, I mean, you're talking, you know, mm -hmm. behind, behind Russell, but then he, he, he lifts more than what Brett Gibbs did more than what Jamar Royster just recently did. And mm -hmm. so now you're, he's going to have the opportunity to, to go back to Malta and defend his title, you know? And so he is, he is the IPF world champion. And now he's, uh, you know, he, he goes back and defends that title and he's going to get a strong charge. You know, you've got Jurens, yeah. uh, Kangamu who, who knocked it out of the park at British nationals um, and made a couple of those third attempts look rather pedestrian and easy. And so we know that, or we would think that, you know, Jurens has got more in the tank and, and, and look, if Delaney makes that, third deadlift, we're talking about even an, an additional seven and a half kilos for him, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. both of those guys have got some additional room <clears throat> to play. And so, um, and then we'll see how the alternates shake out. I mean, maybe we're talking about a Deuce Gruden in the mix too. And yeah. so, you know, possibly making the team as an alternate. And so, um, so that's going to be a fun weight class to see, but I'm, I was excited to see Delaney perform the way that he did, go eight for nine, um, put it all out there, you know, um, go for that last deadlift, um, you know, um, and try to secure that world record and just barely miss it. And so, um, yeah. yeah, that was, that was exciting to see. And, and, yeah, man. and, and kudos for him for having probably the world's greatest clapback video of all time. If you haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> 100 percent uh we don't even have to comment no comment from power thing america uh on that yeah. um but definitely you know yeah. he he definitely and i think it's it's rightfully so too i mean like you said his performances i mean were not up to his own standard i mean by his own words i mean he was not happy with his performances yeah. after that 822.5 and not being able to repeat it and um, not really needing to at PA Nats last year, but definitely could have had a couple. I mean, I think he still ended up winning IPF Worlds by like 10 kilos or something last year. So it didn't end up, but 
but Ina did pull, did, you know, come close to pulling for the win. So he definitely, you know, got the fear of God put into him um, at that meet in South Africa and then definitely came out fired up. Training's looking great. I'm happy for the guy. He's one of the nicest guys in the sport. And um, to be able to silence what I think was a sort of a legitimate doubters out there, you yep. know, um, and to do it on the platform and not on social media, you know, yep. I think that's, that's where you, that's where your, your words will speak the loudest is, is on the biggest stage in the world um, for powerlifting and putting up a total like 835. Yep. Actions speak louder than words. Period. 100%. So yeah. um, that, that, but you're right. Jurens is, is waiting in the wings. And so we will have our battle, a battle there. So that'll be exciting to see um, in Malta. So, okay, dude, well, listen, we've gone on forever. Um, you know, we could, I could just talk to you forever. I don't want to keep you. It's already 11 o'clock at night where we, where we are both in mountain time for once. That's we don't right. have to coordinate across time zones. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but it was awesome to speak with you, man. Um, I, I, uh, any opportunity I get to talk with you, I always try to take advantage of it. Um, same thing with Susie. I hope she's well. Yep. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you wherever I see you again after this. And we should do this again, you know, chop it up. Now, you know, we covered a lot of the basics and the book and stuff. So we won't have to go over that kind of stuff again. But after Malta, you know, we can run this back again and kind of go through the numbers and sh see how things shake out. I think it's great. And, um, you know, it's exciting sports talk, you know, and it's nice yeah, to be able to have someone that actually knows what they're talking about. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I sincerely appreciate it. I just, like you said, really enjoy these opportunities to chop it up, uh, sp you know, specifically when we're talking about a sport that you and I are so heavily invested in. Um, yeah. and, 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 you know, Sheffield was such a magnificent event. I think we're both just ecstatic to see yeah. that happen and then to think of the possibilities. And so um, just remember next year, I think it's February 10th. And that's actually the day before the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, so yeah. if, uh, yeah. That so, hurts me. Yeah, well, it hurts you if, if, if your boys are in it. But anyway, I yeah. kind of mentioned that to Pete Spence. I had shot him an email. I said, you do realize that this is the day before the Super Bowl next year. Like, wow. it, I wonder if they're going to have some kind of watch party. So, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge to SBD, man. Mm -hmm. I hope that they, they can they can hook it up so that if we're over there, we can get our eyes on the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, it's, uh, you know, my my guys are in there a lot. So that's going to be <laughs> trouble. That could be trouble for me. Um, I'm definitely, yeah, I don't know. We have to rethink our, our social media strategy next year for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But um, sure. but yeah, I mean, if we're there, if, if I see you there, we'll definitely, you know, plan to stay, you know, not, not just oh, try no to doubt. catch a flight or whatever. And I've actually watched football in England before. There are, there are uh, sports bars in London, yeah. at least that have, uh, have American football on all the time and they'll stay up late for you and everything. So yeah, we'll yeah. get it. Oh, but it, that would actually, it's kind of interesting because it's back to back the Super Bowl of powerlifting and the super, the, the actual Super Bowl. Yeah, totally, so, totally cool, right? So, I, yeah. yeah, I just kind of mentioned that to Pete, but anyway, it's yeah. it's exciting times. But yeah, thank you again for having me, and yeah. and and I genuinely appreciate your time, and and would would relish the opportunity to come back. All right, awesome, man. Yeah, same here. So, all right, well, with that, that uh, thank you to everyone that's listening, and uh, that's it for the Powerlifting America podcast for today, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace out.